Hebrew Kingdom Building. present to you America's dark past, the Emancipation Proclamation, the illusion of freedom. Now you may ask, this is 2017, and why are we talking about America's dark past? What is that, uh, uh, what's the relevance of that in order to bring us together and bring us closer? Won't that bring a divide? So it's important to understand that you can't move forward unless you understand the things that have happened in the past. Our number one enemy here in America is ignorance. And because of ignorance, we can be deceived or we can have um, blinders over our eyes and can't see where we are going and where we're heading. So it's important. In order to find out what the problem is today, you must go to the root cause of the problem that see what happened in the past that are that has given us the problems that we are experiencing here as a nation today. So this is why it's important not to just move forward, not to just move on like the past don't matter, because in order for us to move for uh, move together as a cohesive group, we must identify what happened in the past that is bringing us our today. So now the scripture says the truth you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. But you will not be able to operate in true freedom unless you identify the lie that has you hostage. Because in order to walk into the true freedom that we have been destined to walk in, we must have truth. And that truth must identify or expose the lie that has been keeping us hostage for so many years. So now, how can we move together? How can we move forward? How can we come together as a nation? We must first do what? We must identify what the truth is according to what happened in the past. It would be just like an abusive relationship that a man and a woman has been together for 15 years, but the man has been abusive for 15 of those years. And then all of a sudden he get a revelation and say, well, look, I want to, I want to just move forward. Let's forget the past. But no, you must go back and deal with the things that have happened in the past in order to move forward in that relationship. So we would take that same model here. What must that husband do first he must at first identify the atrocities and the things that he have done that bring division into that relationship and then the next thing that he must do he must begin to admit that the things that he has done was wrong the things that he has perpetrated on his wife um, was wrong. The next thing he must do is what? Repentance time is to make it right. What can I do to make these things right moving forward? And then we can have forgiveness in the relationship and move forward to healing. So that's the same thing that we must do even as here in America. We must first what? Identify the things that have been done wrong. The people that perpetrated the wrongs must do what? And I'm not talking about your everyday people. I'm talking about the people that are behind the scenes that have been ruling and making decisions um, globally wise and also here that's been controlling America. What we must do first be before we can move on as a nation is to identify what the truth is to get rid of the ignorance that we may move forward. The next thing we must do is the perpetrators must first admit that the things that they have been doing have been wrong. The next thing that we should do after that is have repentance. What can we do as a nation to make these things right? And after that then we can have forgiveness that we can move forward as a cohesive group and bring the true healing that we need here as a nation. So here are what we're doing today as rebirth of a nation. We are identifying the things of the past, the root causes, so we can understand what has been happening and understand our now of why the things are the way that we are. So here we're going, we're moving forward in this uh, presentation called America Dark Past, the Emancipation Proclamation, the Illusion of Freedom.
Police Department has a history of brutality and misconduct. George Zimmerman decides to go ahead and shoot the 17-year-old black boy. His name was Trayvon Martin. We're gonna start with these deadly police shootings. And the officer just shot him in his arm. The Lando Castile has died. Today, at least a dozen police officers hurt after riots exploded overnight in Charlotte. We must first um, go over some quotes that I think that is very important to give us an understanding of where we are. So let's see what the quote says. It said, when a lie is all that is known, the truth is inconceivable. For so many years, we have been fed different lies that we have inherited, believing that these things are true. So when somebody come to you as rebirth of a nation and bringing you the facts and bringing you the truth, it can be inconceivable when you realize the things that we have committed and pledged our heart to have been against us for so many years. So you must realize when a lie is all that is known, the truth is inconceivable. Another quote that we must understand uh, that even Adolf Hitler um, used and said, he said, when a lie is big enough and spoken uh, enough and loud enough, it will be believed as the truth. So think about when a lie has been continued throughout the years and then I as a ruling elite can put my lie in all the textbooks and put my lie in all on all the TV and, and, and movies and magazines and put my lie and make it your education, it will be go on and be believed as the truth. The next quote that we must understand is a quote that says that history is a set of lies that have been agreed upon. Now can we imagine that group of men that are behind the scenes dictating the history that we must know. Dictating the history from what the oppressor's point of view and begin to put this history in our school books and we have to learn this history in order to receive a education. So could it be that we have been receiving a history only one point of view? So that's why it's important for us to understand this and move forward away from our ignorance moving forward in the truth. All right, now we're gonna end before we get into this presentation with these two last quotes that I think is imperative to our understanding. Let's see what uh, Dr. Dresden James said. He said, a truth initial commotion is directly proportional to how deeply the lie was believed. When a well-packaged web of lies have been sold gradually to the masses over generations, the truth was seen utterly preposterous and its speakers raving lunatics. Now, I know in this presentation, uh, first initially hearing some of these things, you might think that we lunatics are thinking that this stuff is crazy and it's gonna conflict with what you've been being taught for so many years. So it's important not to reject something that you haven't investigated. So that leads me to this next quote by Eamon Spencer that says, there is a principle which is bar against all information, which is proof against all argument, which cannot fail to keep a man in what? Everlasting ignorance. That principle is condemnation before an investigation. So before you begin to condemn this or shut it down, do your own investigation, search out history and see if what we're saying is true because again we're trying to get to the root cause to uh, that has caused our problems today so let's move forward
All right, so now, it's important. If we're gonna go back into the past, we gotta go all the way back into the inception of America. And we must deal with the American, the ancient purpose of slavery. What slavery was about in ancient times and show the difference between ancient slavery and the chattel slavery that we received over here in the Americas. Now, ancient slavery, you was only in slavery for three reasons. Either you was a prisoner of war, or you became a slave through rival religions, or you became a slave um, through indentured servanthood. It was slavery was never based on color, it was never based on race, it was based on three proponents. Either you was a prisoner of war, or you was an indentured servant, or rival religions would fight against each other and bring slaves in that way. But it was never done based off your skin color, based off your physical features, based off your traits in order for one uh, 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 race to dominate another. So now that is the reason of ancient and the purpose of slavery, not the child of slavery that we experienced over here in America during times of slavery. So now let's go to the next point. Three things that make this slavery different, that makes chattel slavery different from ancient slavery. Number one, uh, the slavery over here in America was based off of skin color. It was based off of race. And one of the main proponents of the slavery that happened over here was dehumanization. Now that's important to understand because if I am the civilizer, is I'm going to have conflict with the barbaric things that I'm doing if I'm saying these people are uncivilized but yet I'm participating in barbaric things. I'm going to have an inner conflict. So with that, I have to dehumanize you, make your, 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 your value of being a human low, dehumanize you to make me feel better about my inner conflict. So things of dehumanization by bringing you lower, lower than humanity. Now I'm putting you on the level with a beast so I can clear my conscience when it comes to the inner conflict that I have. Things like um, uh, raping the women, uh, things like uh, hanging men and burning men and putting men, uh, the slave's legs on two horses and setting them on fire and slapping both of the horses and splitting them. Being able to sell men and women all across the world. I got to dehumanize you in my mind to make me feel better with my internal conflict. Even got to the point where um, initially, even in Florida, the original gator bait was young slave babies. Over the years, I've been collecting artifacts. As a matter of fact, I've been collecting little pencils like this. I've, been, I've seen uh, alligators uh, on jars. I've seen alligator ashtrays. And I've seen them depicted with kids in it. And I was wondering why the children would be there. As a matter of fact, this particular pencil sharpener, this is a pencil sharpener or a pencil holder with a kid, a black head of a baby sitting out of, the, out of its mouth. I didn't pay any attention. I have uh, been collecting for quite a few few years, and I have the uh, uh, the posters and things like that about different things. And then one day, I was down in Florida. I'd gone down with my wife, and I took a trip for myself off to the Wild Blue Yonder, going out to hunt artifacts. And in my quest to hunt artifacts, I came upon a pawn shop in, Sa in Sanford, Florida. In the pawn shop was a gentleman who owned it. They went and got him and told him I was there, and I wanted to buy some of the shackles he had hanging around the walls. I asked him, uh, could I buy them? He said no. He didn't want to sell anything. He just wanted me to see it. Then we began to talk. Uh, and I asked him, I said, look, please, let me buy something. i got to take something from here. He says, no. He says, uh, I don't want to sell anything. He said, but uh, I'm going to the back and I'll sit down. Meanwhile, he came out and uh, came back out. And he began to talk to me. He said, you know, he said, you probably don't know this. He said, but uh, years ago, he said, my great grandfather, my grandfather before he died, told me of the things they would do. He said he would go down. He said his grandfather said they would go down and they would take babies with them. I said, what do you mean babies? He says, well, let me tell you. He said the slave babies, the slaves who had babies, they would steal the babies during the course of the day, sometimes when the mothers weren't washing. I said, what do you mean babies? I said, you mean babies like five or six years old? He says, no, these babies, some would be infants. Some would be a year old. He said some would be toddlers. He said they would grab these children and take them down to the, the swamp and leave them in pens like little chicken coops. They would go down there at night, take these babies and tie them up because they hunted the big bull alligators. These big bull alligators were not raised on the farms. 
they were in the wild. These alligators would weigh six, seven, eight hundred pounds. Those are the ones they wanted. They would skin them, make the wallets, get the meat, do different things with them. He said, but what they were doing was tie them up, put a rope around their neck and around their torso around here and tie it tight. He said, the baby, I said, well, what would the babies be doing? He said, well, my grandfather said they'd be screaming. He said, what would you do? He said, say, just let them scream. He said, what they would do, it would help them to chum the water. He said, when they would throw the babies in tied to this rope, he said, in a matter of minutes, he said, the alligators were on them. He said the alligators would clamp his jaws on that child. Swat, as a matter of fact, once he clamped on him, he was really swallowed. He was, you couldn't see anything but the rope. And we would pull the alligator in and tie his nose and hit him in the head with an axe, a pickaxe. He said we would then drag him to the shore. We'd drag him to the shore and leave him lay and we would do it again, maybe two or three times a night. He said, I said, so what do you mean? He said, well, yeah, they were taking these babies and killing them for alligator bait. I said, so all these things I've been collecting, all these things I've been collecting are really, really something that I can really talk about and say they're of a truth by what you say. He said, I'm telling you, he said, nobody wants to talk about it. He said, I'm only telling you because you're here. I may never hear from you again. He said, but these things actually depict the acts that they did to slave babies back in the Bayou country and down the south, they did this. They hunted alligators with these babies. That's why they call alligator bait. Uh, doing different things where we would rip the skin off people of color and use those for your belts and for your shoes. I have to dehumanize you in order to make myself feel better about the atrocities that I'm doing to you. And the next thing that happened that makes the slavery different is not giving you the ability to be able to learn or to read. See, that's important. Not just not giving you, most of the time in ancient slavery, they were still able to learn about history and learn to read and different things of that nature. But in this chattel slavery, it was outlawed. It was codified in laws that you couldn't read. So why is that important? I got to strip you completely away from your history in order to form you into the slave mentality that I desire you to have. I'm going to form your mentality. I'm going to form your thinking process. I'm going to form your development and your growth. And it must be no higher than a beast. So it's important for them to codify laws because you would think of it in this manner, right? Just say that you had a king that had a kingdom and he had sons. And all of a sudden, some uh, nation came in, took his son away. His son was three years old, took his son away and made him lower than a beast, made him an animal. In order, and him not realizing that all of his history is based off of him being connected to his father. So what they would do, they would shut off his ability to learn his history because he wouldn't be able to understand in his history, he was a priest. In his history, he was a king. In his history, he was above all. But if I take away his history, I can keep him at the level of a beast. But his being able to move forward or his being able to come back into his priesthood and his kingship will be based off of his historical perspective, him understanding what his history is. So that is important and that was a reason that they decided to cut you off of your history because they didn't want us to know, the elite didn't want us to know how great we are as a people and as a nation. You can see the kinghood and the priesthood in us through the influence that we have where we influence all nations even in our unrighteousness. We got people over there in other nations, like people over there in China trying to do the things that black Americans do. Sagging up their pants and talking slang. They doing the same things we doing. Let you see the influence that we have as kings. And the next thing that all the world benefited of our slavery. This was a worldwide global slave, slavery. Uh, uh, where you look at most of the European nations or most of the supreme nations that's ruling and the most wealthy nations became wealthy of our slavery. Imagine being able to ship people all over the world, not just hundreds, but millions of people for almost 300 and some years and getting free labor from them. Building wealth as a nation, making your nation supreme, but then you tell those people that your nation was built off of what? 
Christian values. And because of their ignorance, they buy that lie. So it's important to understand that this every top supreme nation that is ruling now got their supremeness and their financial wealth based off the slavery that our people went through and the atrocities that happened. So let's get ready to go into the presentation uh, to a greater level and understand about what racism really is. Okay, now dealing with racism, because a lot of times we look at somebody just being prejudiced or saying hateful things that they are racist. So let's see and get a full understanding of what racism really is. Let's look at the definition. Let's look at the definition of race. Race is the classification of humans into groups. Now, now we're seeing that race is a group thing. Not just an individual, but race is the classification of humans into groups based off what? Physical traits, ancestry, genetics, social relations, or the relations between them. So we're able to see that race deals with the grouping of people. Now let's look at the grouping of people versus what Dr. Francis Chris Wilson stated what white supremacy is. Because now we see that race is not based off the three things that we said. It's not based off being a prisoner of war in child slavery. It wasn't based off a rival religion in child slavery. And it was not based off indentured servanthood. It was solely based off of color and physical uh, features of a group. So now let's look at what this group is doing in order to keep themselves on top because race is the sense of the racing of the races to control the rest of the races. So now let's move forward. Let's look at what Dr. Francis Chris Wilson said about racism. She stated that it's a system that is practiced by the global white minority. This is where we get the phrase of white supremacy. On both conscious and unconscious level to ensure the genetic survival by any means necessary. According to Wilson, this system attacks people of color, particularly people of African descent, in nine major areas of activity. Economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. So what we're seeing is ra racism coupled with white supremacy is the domination. Now when I say white supremacy, I'm not just talking about you're just normal everyday people that you're working with. Yeah, and they might partici participate in white privilege, but white supremacy was set up by the elites that rule this nation and elites that rule the world uh, behind the scenes. So let's look at it again. It's the domination of economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. The domination of every area in life to ensure their dominance and supremeness of the race over all other races that are on the planet now. So racism is the domination of one race in every area of humanity that dominates all the other races and stay supreme. But it has to be more to it than that. Now let's see why we have to need use the term white supremacy. What was important to make it about color than any other reason. So let's move forward and see. When you begin to look at history and look at the first European nation, or for lack of a better term, the first American term, white nation, a non-melanated nation to rule the world, you would go back as a global empire of the Greeks. And when the Greeks would go into other nations and, and rule, what they would try to do, they would take the women and they would have sex with the women in order to produce babies in order to reproduce themselves. But what they began to realize is these babies that they would have would have the physical features of the people of, of melanin or melanated people or of black people. They would notice that the baby's hair wouldn't be straight as their hair. They would notice that the baby nose wouldn't be as pointed as their nose. They would notice that the baby would have more of the physical features of the oppressed rather than the oppressor. So what would they do? From this understanding, they would begin to see 
and realize that people of color have what dominant genes and people of non-melanated people have recessive genes understanding that the first human being was a person of color that produces every color that we see around the world today so what they begin to see is that they were the minority on the earth now in America we are taught that we are the minority which is true we make up 13 percent of America but on a global scale the European of non-melanated people are the minority on earth. So they begin to realize that we must ensure our genetic survival. So now racism is not just not power and control of economics and domination of all other races, but it is to the core of it, to the elite that is running, not just your everyday, but the elite that is running these nations, is genetic survival of their seed. Because they realize that everybody that we mix with, they become more of the physical features of the people of color. So in order to ensure that, we must govern, we must rule, and we must dominate the other races to ensure what? Our genetic survival. So why in this captivity, and this chattel slavery, they focused on, this is what Dr. West was able to show us, they focused on the genitalia area where they would castrate slaves. And most of your ancient history with melanated slavery or indentured servanthood, they didn't fool with the genitalia. But because of the reproduction, just because of your genetics, you become a threat to my survival. So now, I must castrate you or systematically kill you and to control every area of your life because racism becomes by color and also becomes by the supreme and the elite genetic survival. I said, oh, okay. Now I understand the discussions that were going on before talking about black male female relations. You've got to understand that those problems are tied to the system of white supremacy. And they are tied in a particular way. And they are tied in this way. Where's my Oh, here's the race. That if the problem that the people who classify themselves as white, if the problem that they face is white supremacy for the purpose of white genetic survival. Are you with me? Right. So th this is the key. This tiny group of people, this tiny minority of people on the planet are trying to survive genetically. And so their thing, a lot of people say, oh no, their thing is money. Mm -mm, they make money. They don't make melanin. <laughs> See, they manufacture money. But God makes melanin. Now, they didn't have it, and so their struggle is to survive genetically. Now, black men and black women, we are all equal people. We are not the same. Women are not the same as men, and men are not the same as women. The critical issue of white genetic survival is related when it comes to black, brown, red, and yellow people is that black, brown, red, and yellow women cannot cause white genetic annihilation. See how quiet it is, the women are offended. <laughs> no. Women cannot force men to have sexual intercourse. Is that true? See, you can entice. Nice perfume, nice clothes, nice words. Entice. But if you try to force a man to have sexual intercourse, you're going to whip out your M16 rifle and say, you better come on. 
And if you fight him, what's gonna happen? <laughs> See, now these are basic facts of physiology. It doesn't require anybody to make this up. This is basic physiology so that women cannot force sexual intercourse. Men, white, black, brown, red, and yellow, can impose sexual intercourse. See, I'm not talking about rapists, but I'm talking about they can impose sexual intercourse. So that the critical issue of white genetic survival comes down and attacks males differentially than it does females. You see, in other words, a white male can decide, now I want to make some lighter colored black people so I'm going to have sex with a black woman. That's his decision. The woman cannot, the black female, the non-white female, cannot impose that decision on any white male or any non-white male. But males can impose this decision. And so because of all of the levels of color, black, brown, red and yellow. Black is the highest level of melanin pigmentation. Brown, red and yellow, these are lesser levels of the same pigment. So that the white people understood, the white collective understood, if we are to survive genetically, we must impose control on men and we impose it directly in proportion to the amount of pigment that you can produce. So that growing up on the south side of Chicago, you learn, if you are black, get back. If you are brown, stick around. If you are yellow, you're mellow. If you're white, you're right. Now I was just in London and I went through this and all the people who from Africa and the Caribbean just went right through, they know it too. <laughs> All of the non-white people all over the world, Asia, Africa, the islands of the South Seas, wherever, where there has been confrontation with white, everybody knows how the colors stack up relative to threat to white genetic survival, although people never understood that the reason that the colors had to be put down in such a way was related to white fear of white genetic annihilation. So because of that, because of that problem, imposing major stress, now there's stress on all of us, males and females alike, but there is horrendous stress on the men because the men present the threat to white genetic survival. Right here in this city, long time ago, 3149 Elks, but my parents, and my grandmother were in our dining room and they were talking about somebody had been lynched. I was a little girl, very little. They were talking about somebody had been lynched and they were kind of talking in hushed tones and I remember asking my grandmother, Granny, why did they do that? My grandmother said, well, because some people have to act ugly. Now, lynching and castration means what? to kill and to attack the genitals of the black man. See, I always wonder, well, what, what, what is that all about? See, black men may do many things. You've never heard tell in history of a black man attacking a white man's genitals. It's no history. It's no history of people of color attacking white people's genitals. But there is global history of people who classify themselves as white attacking the genitals of non-white men. So you say, why? Because the brain computer wants to understand in depth so that it can move with greater power. So we say, why? And we end up with this. Here's the black man's genitals. Attack this and destroy this, why? Because in the testicles is what? The genetic material and the genetic material that can cause white annihilation. Do you understand? Doesn't it make sense? Absolutely. <laughs> makes sense to me. Now beyond that, 
that as the white collective looked at the black male and says, he has weapon that can destroy me. He has weapon that can cause me genetic annihilation. So the white brain computer said, I must create weapons that can do same thing. Must create weapon can do same thing. <laughs> must create weapon. So indeed they did create a weapon. And if you look at, here is the lateral view of the male genitalia. Can you all see it? <laughs> Absolutely. I'll ask for a model. <laughs> Absolutely. 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 <laughs> All right, but look at this. Here's the front view of the male genitalia. Here is the lateral view. Turn the lateral view around 90 degrees and you have that. See, if you turn this around, just turn it. And then what is this but this? That's a gun. Do you see? Can you see that? Oh, wow. They can't see it. Some models by Yes, I need a model. <laughs> this. Does that help? The volunteer. The volunteer. They want to volunteer. <laughs> Just imagine, think of, a, think of the man standing with no clothes on. You see his genitalia. You see two testicles and a phallus, penis, okay? Now, a side view is like one testicle and phallus, and if you turn it around, you can see that it is the same as the gun. Are you with me? That's the idea of the model, okay. Now, what does within the white supremacy system and culture, what do they call the gun? Come on class, this is a workshop. The great equalizer. Oh, do you understand? This then becomes equal to this. If he has a weapon, meaning the black male's genitalia, testicles, genetic material, that can cause white genetic annihilation, the white collective says we will produce a gun that will be the equalizer. And the people who are by law allowed to carry the gun, anytime they see a black male and they think, I want to kill him, he can annihilate me, then they call it what? Justifiable homicide. That's right, that's right. Are you with me? Yeah. Absolutely. All for the purpose, not of economics, but for the purpose of what? White genetic survival. Now, how does this then come down and impact on the family? But let me say before I go further, that there is a lot of material. If you understand what I'm saying here, there are many things that you will understand about the white supremacy system and culture that you look at every day but you really do not think about. Most people do not realize, see we're getting ready to come around towards February, February 14th, Valentine's Day. The most important thing about Valentine's Day is that it's a day in the white supremacy system and culture in which they give out chocolate candy. Well. The white female likes the white male to give her chocolate candy. <laughs> <laughs> now as black females, <laughs> we follow, you know, whatever they do, that's what we do. We want some chocolate candy too, without realizing that we already have. <laughs> Our chocolate candy. <laughs> See, we don't understand that this Valentine 
with all these little pieces of chocolate candy. How many of you read the newspaper around Valentine's Day and see where they're talking about ooh, dark and erotic chocolate? Absolutely. And did you ever say, why? What are they talking about? What they are talking about is that within the framework of the white supremacy system and culture, the white female describes her ideal mate as who? Tall, dark, and handsome. Absolutely. <laughs> Do you all understand? So when they began to see that nine-tenths of the world was melanated or people of color and one-tenth made up there, they began to realize that we have to dominate all resources, all areas in life, and also systematically kill them because now you are a threat to me based off of your genetics. So we can't say I'm not going to participate in this race war. We are in a war and don't realize that we are in this war. And this is what is killing us because we're ignorant to what is going on. So this is why the elite will kill you no matter what. Because just because of your genetics, it makes you a threat to their genetic survival. So let's move on because we, was, we are even able to see how this creeped over even into the games that they made. Even into every aspect of their life, they wanted to ensure that anything that they created remind them of the dominance of the racism, the race for of races for nationalism, the race of races for dominance, and at the core of it, genetic survival, they even put it in their games. Now you look at pool. The ball that hits all the other balls is the cue ball, which is what? The white ball. All the rest of the balls stay in a triangle. And the middle of the ball is what? The eight ball, which is what? The most threat to their genetic survival, which is the eight ball, the black ball, which produce what? All the other colors of the ball. So when he, when, when the person that's playing pool strikes the ball, he hits them and divides them into every corner. Just like in our slavery, they hit us and divided us into all the four corners of the earth begin to ship us out through all the four corners of the earth. And once they knock all the other colors down, dominating them, what is the last ball that is on the table? It's the eight ball. The one that is the most threat to their genetic survival. That's the last threat and the last ball that has to go into the hole under the earth. When they knock their ball under the earth, it ensures it's complete rulership over all other colors remaining on top. So this is why it's important to understand what racism really is. It's not just prejudice, but it's dominance using an avenue of prejudice and white supremacy to dominate every other area of life and also to ensure what? Their genetic survival. And this is why they are systematically, the ruling elite systematically are killing us on a daily, weekly, yearly basis that is destroying us as a nation as a whole. Now that we understand what racism really is, now let's go through the history and you'll be able to see that racism, this dominance or this genetic survival would be the baseline of all the atrocities and everything that happened to us as a nation of people over here. All right, so now let's go back to the race to the new world, the inception of America and um, Everybody coming over here exploring America. You had the native Indians over here, but then uh, imperialism began to happen. Colonization began to happen where they began to kill the Indians and uh, uh, began to set up land for themselves. So what began to evolve out of that is what is called the head right system. And the head right system is basically a system that was set up over here in America in order to get uh, other European countries to come over here in these land and begin to develop and grow the land. 
because different crops, other crops at, at some point over here when they first started and initially over here wasn't doing as well and then tobacco began to become a major crop over here in America. So what did they do? They had labor shortages because there was not enough people over here. So what they did, they set up the head right system. The head right system allowed for every person that came over here to America, they got 50 acres of land that was just given to them. And what they began to do, if say if you had a poor family that couldn't afford to come over here because one person that had the money to come over here to America and get their 50 acres, and that just won 50 acres for him, but if he bought his family over here for every family member, they got 50 acres. But you have people that was over here in, in uh, European countries that was poor. So what the, um, some of the elite ones would do, they would pay their way, what the head right system gave them the right to, is to pay their way over here. So uh, what it cost in today's term to get a person that was not wealthy over here was almost around, I believe, 212 to $300 an hour of uh, uh, modern day time. And they would bring them over here. Now the conditions was rough coming over. So some of this, uh, the, um, the, uh, the more poor people didn't make it, but they got 50 acres no matter what, if they came or if they didn't come. So what would happen for their getting their uh, way paid over here to America, what they would do is promise indentured servanthood. So they would serve the person that paid their way over here from five to seven years of service. And after that point, they would begin to get their own land and be able to develop their own land. So what happened, you had uh, different uh, European nations, different ones coming over here from all over, getting uh, 50 acres. And this is why you see even in the slave ships, why they was, uh, would pack so many of the African slaves together in that ship because they got 50 acres a slave. So this is a, a part of the reason even why your Irish began to come over here and most of them well, didn't have the money so they was indentured servant. So yes, in uh, uh, different times that they was done wrong, they was uh, well, was tricked and doing more to five to seven years, uh, different things, atrocities and stuff happened to them while you had some African slaves over here also. So what they began to do they began at one point to bind together and come together against the more the wealthy people and uh, set up uh, fights and do different things in order to take different lands to bind together. And what happened is the wealthy, the elites, is that we got to find some way to suppress all of these uprisings. At the very same time that America refused to give the Negro any land, through an act of Congress, our government was giving away millions of acres of land in the West and the Midwest, which meant that it was willing to undergird its white peasants from Europe with an economic floor. But not only did they give the land, they built land-grant colleges with government money to teach them how to farm. Not only that, they provided county agents to further their expertise in farming. Not only that, they provided low interest rates in order that they could mechanize their farms. Not only that, today many of these people are receiving millions of dollars in federal subsidies not to farm, and they are the very people telling the black man that he ought to lift himself by his own bootstraps. And this is what we are faced with, and this is the reality. Now, when we come to Washington in this campaign, we are coming to get our check. All men are created equal. All men are created equal. It's the lofty and revolutionary ideal at America's core. Yet it was written at a time when some inhabitants were held in bondage and others were being dispossessed of their lands. How did American society justify unequal treatment based on skin color and national origins? How did it reconcile that contradiction? America created a story, a story of race. We have the idea that it's somewhere written in stone that there are these fundamental differences between human beings. 
We don't realize that race is an idea that evolves over time, that it has a history, that it is constructed by a society to further certain political and economic Bacon's goals. rebellions led to tighter British control of the colony. It may also have hastened the movement toward a labor system based on black slavery. Some historians argue that the Virginia planters, fear, fearing another insurrection by the frontier white servants, began to turn to Africa for laborers. The strategy was to divide blacks and whites by creating an artificial color line. It's at this moment when race and racism radically alters the system of forced labor that had been practiced by human civilizations for thousands of years by injecting race into the equation. Again, Tim Wise explains. So there was no white race, but in the colonies of what would become the United States, what did we see in the 1660s, 1670s? We began to see that Africans of indentured servant staff realized, as did the white indentured servants, the Europeans who hadn't even been called white yet, that they had a lot of things in common, like the fact that they were all getting their clock cleaned by the elite. And so they would get together more than our history books taught us to foment rebellion against the elite, to try to get a better deal for themselves on the basis of economic necessity and economic justice. And what did the elite do when you see that you're outnumbered by black and white folks who are penniless, landless, peasants? You have to do one of two things. You either have to kill them all, but you can't do that because who's going to work? Rich folks weren't going to. They had to get poor people to work. The whole point was to be a person of leisure back in those days. That was the goal, was not to work. So you couldn't kill them all. You didn't want to kill them all. You have to do the work yourself. You have to build your own levy, build your own house. No, pick your own tobacco, harvest your own cotton. No, we're not going to do any of that. So you can't kill them, but you can co-opt them. And so the elite in Virginia, for example, the colony, begins to give certain carrots to people of European descent, saying things like, you know, we're going to let you own a little land. Not much, but just a little. And we're going to get rid of indentured servitude. Now you're free labor. And by the way, once you're free labor, you get 50 acres of land just because you're free labor, see? So we're gonna cut you in on this deal. We're gonna let you enter into contracts. We're gonna let you testify in court. And here's the best of all, we're gonna put you on the slave patrol to keep those people in line, right? The idea was, you're still gonna get your clock clean. We still don't like you. We still aren't gonna really empower you or change your economic subordination, but we're gonna make you honorary members of this team and you're gonna help us keep those other people down. So they got a little taste of power, and it did effectively divide and conquer those coalitions. Those rebellions began to stop almost instantly. So that's when you go back to race being based off color, because during that time in the 1400s, race was never based on color. But then you see a turn up into the 17th and 18th century that it began to be based on color. So what they told the white indentured servants is, well, look, we're going to bring you into what is called the good old boy club. We're going to bring you over to into the wealthy club based off of you being white. So now your skin color is going to make you think that you're more supreme than another. So by you understanding and functioning in your skin color being white, it made you look at the African as he a lower class than you. Now y'all got somewhat of the same condition. Of course the Africans was done a little worse. But y'all got somewhat of the same condition. The only thing that you have over him is your skin color is white. Now you'd have been tricked to thinking that you on a financial wealthy team based off you your skin being white. And you being ignorant to you being the poor. And these are the same people that became the ones that governed the other slaves on the slave plantation. These are the ones that were the overseers of uh, the rest of the African slave. Now they began to be uplifted based off their skin color being white and uh, people of African descent skin color being black. Now it's important not to just deal with everything that happened, but what's important to us here at Rebirth of the Nation is to understand the psychology behind slavery. Um, because the ball and chain of slavery have left us, but the psychology of slavery can still be self-refueling in the slave 
descendants mind right now still controlling them. So what I began to look at and what we began to study is the Willie Lynch letter. And this letter began to show it's not some confusion out there that's saying if, uh, if Willie Lynch ever really lived as a man but that doesn't matter the system that he set up or the system that was set up is living and still self refueling up today so now i always wonder how a few masters or overseers were able to control up to 100 slaves up to uh 200 slaves but when i began to realize the psychology behind the willow lynch letter that helped me understand how they was able to control their mind and also make that control be self-refueling all the way up into 2017 we still are controlled by the things that are written in the willow lynch letter that has been imprinted imprinted in our heart that we are self-refueling and carry out so let's look at the psychology behind the making of a slave and a Willow Lynch letter. I'll take the affirmative. Take the meanest, most restless nigger. Strip him of his clothes in front of the remaining male niggers, female niggers, and nigger infants. Tar and feather him. Tie each leg to a horse facing in opposite direction, set him on fire, and beat both horses until they tear him apart in front of the male, female, and nigger infants. Bullwhip and beat the remaining nigger males within an inch of their life. Do not kill them, but put the fear of God in them, for they can be useful for future breeding. Anybody know who Willie Lynch was? Anybody? Raise your hand. No one? He was a vicious slave owner in the West Indies. The slave masters in the colony of Virginia were having trouble controlling their slaves, so they sent for Mr. Lynch to teach them his methods. The word lynching came from his last name. His methods were very simple, but they were diabolical. Keep the slave physically strong, but psychologically weak and dependent on the slave master. Keep the body, take the mind. I and every other professor on this campus are here to help you to find Take back and keep your righteous mind. Because obviously you have lost it. This speech was delivered by Willie Lynch on the banks of the James River in the colony of Virginia in 1712. Lynch was a British slave owner in the West Indies. He was invited to the colony of Virginia in 1712 to teach his methods to slave owners there. The term lynching is derived from his last name. Greetings, gentlemen. I greet you here on the bank of the James River in the year of our Lord, 1712. First, I shall thank you, the gentlemen of the colony of Virginia, for bringing me here. I'm here to help you solve some of your problems with slaves. Your invitation reached me on my modest plantation in the West Indies, where I have experimented with some of the newest and still the oldest methods for control of slaves. Ancient Rome would envy us if my program is implemented, as our boat sails south on the James River, named for our illustrious king, whose version of the Bible we cherish, I saw enough to know that your problem is not unique. While Rome used cords of wood as crosses for standing human bodies along its highways in great numbers, you were here using the tree and the rope on occasions. I caught the whiff of a dead slave hanging from a tree a couple miles back. And you're not only losing valuable stock by hangings, you are having uprisings, slaves are running away, your crops are sometimes left in the fields too long for maximum profit, you suffer occasional fires, your animals are killed. Gentlemen, you know what your problems are. I do not have to elaborate. I am not here to enumerate your problems. I am here to introduce you to a method of solving them. In my bag here, I have foolproof method for controlling your black slaves. I guarantee every one of you that if installed correctly, it will control the slaves for at least 400 years. My method is simple. Any member of your family or your overseer can use it. I have outlined a number of differences among slaves and I take these differences and I make them bigger. I use fear, distrust, and envy for control purposes. These methods have worked on my modest plantation in the West Indies and it will work throughout the South. Take this simple little list of differences and think about them. On the top of my list is age. 
but it's there only because it starts with an A. The second is color or shade. There is intelligence, size, sex, sizes of plantations, status on plantations, attitude of owners, whether the slaves live in the valley, on the hill, east, west, north, south, have fine hair, coarse hair, or is tall or short. Now that you have a list of differences, I shall give you an outline of action. But before that, I shall assure you that distrust is stronger than trust and envy stronger than adulation, respect, or admiration. The black slaves, after receiving this indoctrination, shall carry on and will become self-refueling and self-generating for hundreds of years, maybe thousands. Don't forget, you must pitch the old versus the, the old black male versus the young black male. The young black male against the old black male. You must use the dark-skinned slaves versus the light-skinned slaves and the light-skinned slaves versus the dark-skinned slaves. You must use the female versus the male and the male versus the female. You must also have white servants and overseers who distrust all black, but it's necessary that your slaves trust and depend on us. They must love, respect, and trust only us. Gentlemen, these kids are your keys to control them, use them. Have your wives and children use them, never miss an opportunity. If used intensely for one year, the slaves themselves will remain perpetually distrustful. Thank you, Jimmy. Take the female and run a series of tests on her to see if she will submit to your desires willingly. Test her in every way because she is the most important factor for good economics. If she shows any sign of resistance and submitting completely to your will, do not hesitate to use the bullwhip on her to extract that last bit of bitch out of her. Take care not to kill her, for in doing so you spoil good economics. When in complete submission, she will train her offsprings in the early years to submit to labor when they become of age. Understanding is the best thing. Therefore, we shall go deeper into this area of the subject matter concerning what we have produced here in this breaking process of the female nigger. We have reversed the relationship in her natural uncivilized state. She would have a strong dependency on the uncivilized nigger male and she would have a limited protective tendency toward her independent male offspring and would raise male offsprings to be dependent like her. Nature had provided for this type of balance. We reversed nature by burning and pulling a civilized nigger apart and bull whipping the other to the point of death all in her presence. By her being left alone, unprotected, with the male image destroyed, the ordeal caused her to move from psychologically dependent state of, to a frozen independent state. In this frozen psychological state of independence, she will raise her male and female offspring in reverse roles. For fear of the young male's life, she will psychologically train him to be mentally weak and dependent, but physically strong. Because she has become psychologically independent, she will train her female offsprings to be psychologically independent. What have you got? You've got the nigger woman out front and the nigger man behind and scared. This is a perfect situation of sound sleep and economics. Before the breaking process, we had to be alertly on guard at all times. Now we can sleep soundly for out of frozen fear his woman stands guard for us. He cannot get past her early slave voting process. He is a good tool, now ready to be tied to the horse at a tender age. By the time a nigger boy reaches the age of 16, he is soundly broken in and ready for a long life of sound and efficient work and the reproduction of a unit of a good labor force. Continually, through the breaking of uncivilized savage niggers, by throwing the nigger female savage into a frozen psychological state of independence, by killing the protective male image, and by creating a submissive dependent mind of the nigger male slave, we have created an orbiting cycle that turns on its own axis forever, unless a phenomena occurs and reshifts the position of the male and female slaves. We show what we mean by example. Take the case of the two economic slave units and examine them close. Now it's very important to understand the unnatural conditioning of the mind of the slaveholders and also the slave families. Because how, if I was to take a baby sheep right now and take a hammer and bash his head in, hang him and set him on fire, that would bring most of us over here in America to tears. You would have some animal rights people come to try to arrest me. Uh, some people would, say, would be saying that I need 
to be uh, put in prison for that. But when you look during slavery times and you look all at all the lynchings, and all the lynchings happened after slavery now, and you look at the hanging of the people and the burning of the people, that they would gather and bring children to what is called a picnic. And a picnic was pick a nigga to hang him and they would come all around, bring food, bring everything, and bring their children to these things to enjoy, almost like you're going to a, a, a football or basketball game, to enjoy the killing of an African slave. And, and in this picture here, you see a young girl that is smiling. Now, what kind of thinking process can you have to look at something that is that atrocious and begin to smile and enjoy it and begin to even after those things that they would sell the body parts of those African slaves. They would cut off, somebody would say, give me a finger, or give me an ear, or give me a head, or give me a foot, and they would set these things up in their houses to keep. There's this, he's a veteran investigator, and he uh, was talking to this gentleman, basically getting his side of the story about how this gentleman's mother was left to die because she was African American, and the person who was supposed to be working on her wouldn't give her CPR because of that. So he's getting all of this information and uh, getting the full story from him, and then all of a sudden starts asking him a lot of crazy questions. Uh, this dude, uh, Sewell, because um, you don't know him, so we don't care about his first name. William. <laughs> oh, thank you. He says, the first thing he said to the guy is, have you ever been in a penitentiary? To oh. which, uh, to which uh, Sean Mullen said, uh, I find that very insulting, actually. Then the guy launched into a story about how they used to, uh, he has ancestors from that, that part of town that uh, had, were part of a lynch mob, and they lynched a young black man, and they skinned him. And he was very proud to tell this man that they each took pieces of skin off of the man's back and used it as a knife sharpener uh, strap. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how you don't take that as some kind of threat, some kind of emotional, physical, any kind of threat. I'd but be, he certainly did. I and would, Yes. I would be too confused to be threatened. <laughs> <laughs> well, wait, 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 yes. but, again, but there's a punchline. Because when they asked Sewell about this, he said, he insisted to the station that he was just trying to convince Mullins and the others in the meeting that he understood what racism was like. Mm. Okay, mm. so now the thing is, I, you know, I, I could have found that somewhat conceivable because it, everybody in the story keeps talking about how emotional he was in telling the story, how forceful he was in telling the story. And you think maybe some dudes are weird, right? Yeah. Like maybe he was trying to find a way to relate with them. Now the thing that makes it a little less believable is the fact that he asked the guy whether he'd been in a penitentiary yes. before. Right out of the gate. Right, right out of the gate. And we found out later in an investigation of the investigator, okay, that it turns out that he might know the fire chief who was being investigated. Right. Okay. So now his job is to do an investigation to make sure that none of the government officials did anything wrong. Right? Uh, and Mullins comes and says, this looks pretty bad. The, the guy said, I'm going to not do CPR and hence let your mom die, which she did, because she's black. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't get any worse than that. And this guy's telling the story, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, first of all, have you ever been in prison? And second of all, you know, remember when we used to lynch black guys? Okay, so that, I don't think that's the guy you want investigating whether there was racism. No, <laughs> and they use, they use a word that when, you know, because we've already established that the guy telling the story is a little off kilter. Uh, Sean Mullins, who was the one saying uh, this dude threatened and offended me, said that the guy got a little excited when he was telling this lynching story. So maybe there's another element to this. An yeah. even crazier sub-element to this. In the beginning, he was telling the guy, oh, I got it. I still have that from the lynching in 1896, yes. right? Crazy. That's been passed down throughout my family. Oh, yeah. And then when they said, what the fuck were you saying to this guy? Are you insane or whatever? And he's like, oh, no, no, it's OK. It's OK. I went back and looked, and I couldn't find the skin. Yeah. So it's yeah, OK. Yeah, it's got lost somewhere along oh, the way. Oh, oh, OK, then not guilty. <laughs> it's right. like trying to find a strap in the middle of a, you know, a white sheet stack. Right. It's almost yeah. impossible. Right. right. That's right. Yeah. It's okay. so dark and insane. Yeah. The whole yeah. thing is just. Yeah. But you know, the reason why I found this story so powerful, other than unbelievable racism that you see still 
active alive and well and, and applied to people. I mean, my, forget what happened to Mullins himself, which is unbelievable Horrible. and outrageous. They let his mom die because she was black and they would refuse to do CPR. And that's, that's a million. She died because yeah. of that, and that's right? That's not the main part of the story. You're right. That's amazing. So, but it's so powerful because. It reminds me of when I learned about lynchings for the first time. You know, you read it in the history books. Oh, there's lynchings and they hang people, et cetera. There's lynch bombs. But they don't tell you the full story. And I was at a small, really small civil rights museum in, in Alabama. And, and, I re and this is really, I mean, if you're uncomfortable, you know, just a warning here of how they used to do the lynchings, right? But it gives you a sense of the terror that uh, African Americans must have lived in back then, right? Because, and of course the lynchings could have been for the most minor thing, looking at a white woman the wrong way and saying the wrong words to a white guy, whatever, right? So there'd be the, uh, the hanging, but there would also be the burning, and there would also be the cutting of the genitals, and, and, and then putting that in certain places. And this is, of course, when they were alive, before they hung and uh, hanged them and burned them, et cetera. And, but, this, but those, okay, so those are horrible forms of torture. But the two things that got me the most was, people would have a picnic around the lynching. Yeah. And that's what this guy's referring to, right? So it's real, I mean, it was obviously. It's a social event. Yeah, it was, and they would bring their kids, yeah. okay? And then they would take home memorabilia, just like this guy's talking about. They would cut a piece of the body, the skin, and then they would take it home, like, oh, they remember the fun lynching we went to, and then we talked, it took the skin home, and then we, we, but it's okay, we used it, we made it into something, et cetera. Right. Now, like, so when you hear, you know, sometimes we cover stories about the guys who hang the Confederate flags, and they're like, no, 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 this is our heritage. But dude, that's also your heritage. And sometimes heritage is a great thing, and sometimes it's a miserable thing, yeah. right? So don't put up that flag. That's what that flag stands for. It's not like it's ancient history. We still got guys carrying around that skin yeah. and threatening people with that story, like it happened yesterday. And they would set these things up in their houses to keep as a memorial to what they have done. What kind of thinking process, what kind of conditioning that your mind have to go through to think that is okay or to be okay with it or get gratification for something that is that terrible. So now we have today a theory called cognitive dissonance. Dealing with the unnatural conditioning of a people to make them find gratification and destroying another human being and burning another human being and uh, mutilating another human being, bringing family members and everybody out to see it and enjoy the, the, the destruction of a people. So it's something has to be wrong. It has to be a condition of the mind because that is not normal. That is not a normal thing. That is not something that is humanly possible. So a conditioning had to be going on to make people think that they deserve this, this person deserved these things. So this is what cognitive dissonance theory comes in mind. And cognitive dissonance is something that happens internally, that happens to you when you begin to do things that's different between your core values. If I say that I am the civilizer, or I'm civilizing these people, and I'm taking them from their barbaric state, but yet I begin to practice in barbaric things, something begin to happen in my mind that I have an internal conflict, that I begin to war with myself within to say that something is wrong, but I have to silence that. I have to silence that internal conflict, so now I must go through a conditioning process to make me okay with this, to make me think that these people deserve this, this feeling of what we are, of what they was experienced was called cognitive dissonance. Now let's move forward from here. And then of course, and this is interesting about uh, John Newton because we all know about in every the first thing you hear, John Newton. What's the next thing you hear? Amazing Grace, John Newton. Amazing Grace. Well, let's figure out what happened before he got Amazing Grace. He said slaves are lesser creatures without Christian souls and thus are not destined for the next world. Now what becomes important about this kind, and you'll see it both in American history as well, is there is this kind of dehumanization of African people. Because you gotta ask yourself this question, how do people who deem themselves superior, who see themselves as the civilizers, who recognize themselves as the, what we call manifest destiny, the white man's burden of civilizing all the rest of the, the races. 
How do you reconcile being the superior being and engaging in barbaric behavior? What that produces is something called cognitive dissonance. How many people are familiar with that? Cognitive dissonance is really thinking discord. It's when you begin to feel conflict between what you believe or understand or hold to be true, and you are then faced with behaviors, either in yourself or others, that conflict with your fundamental belief. It produces cognitive dissonance. Human beings don't function well with cognitive dissonance. You must remove the cognitive dissonance in order to function. So in order for people to perpetuate slavery, and to perpetuate that whole system that lasts for centuries, you had to remove all dissonance associated with it. Can't be anything wrong with me. Certainly isn't us. We're the civilizers. We're the superior, so it must be them. Oh yes, well you see, they don't even have souls. Now I can go to sleep because I'm not really dealing with the human being. Are you following me? Okay, let's see what else he said. He said, when the women and girls are taken on board a ship, naked, trembling, terrified, they are often exposed to the wanton rudeness of white savages. The prey is divided upon the spot. Look at the choice of words, the prey. Resistance or refusal would be utterly in vain. And then he says, I sinned with a high hand. Yeah, and then he wrote Amazing Grace. <laughs> okay. So it's really important to understand that hand in hand with the behavior was a mindset that is so damaging. You see, I call it the secret. Not the secret that everybody's been talking about, this, that secret. This secret is the kind that makes you sick. How many people here are in mental health, do specific, have done direct mental health treatment with folks? If you're not into, you know that the secrets make us sick, yes? Isn't it the secrets that cause people the pathology, right? How long have white people had to hold this secret? How long and how many generations had to stop and pretend grandpa didn't do what he did? That the wealth we enjoy was not on the backs of some of these little girls. Think about how long one had to keep that secret. And the only thing you could do is either pathologize the other, it's all their fault, because it certainly wasn't great granddad. Look how well he dresses. Do you understand what I'm saying? So this, when I say that this pathology goes hand in hand, I kid you not. So that show that on every level, this conditioning process to make the oppressors feel like the oppressed or the African slaves uh, that they deserve these things. Let's look at the unnatural conditioning process because these things have to happen in every area of life. Uh, your sociology, your uh, anthropology, your religion, all these aspects had to be used to condition the people's mind. Because in science, if I say something is scientific and that I can measure it, then it becomes truth to, uh, to a person. So they had to take every aspect of the learning of the people that were slave masters and their families to condition their mind to approve of these things, to be okay with these things, and the last process in this conditioning to find gratification of these things. So now let's look at every uh, top scholar that was at that time that put these things in books, that was leaders that put these things even in all these different aspects of their life to condition their mind to believe that these things were okay. Let's look at what he said. Then you have science. And whenever we are in a process of trying to legitimize things, it's so amazing. You know, people always say this to me, even black people when they hear about post-traumatic. Because you know it's not correct unless you can count it and measure it, right? Science is the, the final. It is the number one. If you can say it's scientific, then you basically trump everything else, right? Science determines reality. So if we can scientifically assert a thing to be true, then in fact it is true because it's scientifically proven. It's a scientific fact. Matter of fact, that's what people will tell you when you, when you try to say to them, well, I don't know if I agree with you. You know, it's scientific. It's a scientific fact, what I'm saying here, right? Which somehow makes it what? True, and it's also in a book. Now let's do the math. It's in a book and it's scientifically proven. 
Did anybody here realize that recently we lost a planet? Anybody know what planet we lost? How you lose a planet? You know, I was, I became fond of the little picture with the, we lost a planet. We didn't lose a planet. You know what it means? Science was wrong. Now, have they ever said, you know, we were wrong about that planet thing? No. It's called a paradigm shift. So let's go to science. And I think it's important that we do. So we then, again, we go to someone named Carl von Linnaeus. Now, Carl von Linnaeus becomes an important character in this whole conspiracy of silence and legitimacy and removing the dissonance. Carl von Linnaeus developed a system based on a criterion of skin color and laid the basis for 19th century racial classification. Linnaeus properly began the science of anthropology. So here we have the father of anthropology. Although color classification of races dated back to the ancient Egyptians, anthropologists refer to Linnaeus's Systema Natura of 1735 as the first modern study of man. While Linnaeus advanced classification with his use of a color criterion, he also fixed on his four families of man certain moral and intellectual peculiarities that continued into the 19th century anthropological vocabulary. He described Homo Americanus. Who might that be? That would be Native American. American Indians. Homo Americanus, and what did he say about them? He said they were reddish, choleric, obstinate, contented, and regulated by custom. Homo Europaeus, as white, fickle, sanguine, blue-eyed, gentle, and governed by laws. Homo Asiaticus, that'd be Asians, as sallow, grave, dignified, avaricious, and ruled by opinions. And homo affer, as black, phlegmatic, cunning, lazy, lustful, careless, and governed by caprice. These insights into what Linnaeus defined as racial character, personality traits, behavior, intelligence, language, and a host of other related categories were transmitted into subsequent attempts at a science of classification and became more fixed than the races themselves. Not a shred of science here. But it is in a book. And it's touted as science. And what's more important, you know my students, I teach graduate students in, in social work. And they'll say, but Dr. Leary, my God, we're looking at 1707 to 1778. We are, right? After all. But do you not hear these same attributions today? You know those blacks, they're lazy, you know. All of the exact same, am I telling the truth? In your newspapers, in your accounts of them, do you not hear these very same things? So does it matter that it started in 1707 and 1778 and has no scientific merit? That's multi-generational, is it not? It's being passed along. Part of the swallowing into the social gullet. Those are the beliefs, you see. So it doesn't matter whether it's true or not. And thank you, Carl von Linnaeus. Again, he's removing the cognitive what? Don't they deserve to be treated the way we treat them? Have we not just justified what we've done? After all, I just told you this is who they are. We're not wrong, we're just trying to keep the uh, domestic tranquility. Makes sense. I'm having a clicker thing. There we go. Johann Friedrich Blumenbach. Just look at him. He's not right, we could tell already. <laughs> but he had to contribute his part as well. He says, now this man, Johann uh, Friedrich Blumenbach, he was an individual, how many of you are familiar with the term Caucasian? Oh yes, <laughs> then you know Johann. He would designate 
did five races of varieties of man in the, session, in the second edition of his work on the natural variety of mankind. His division into Caucasian, Mongolian, American, Ethiopian, and Malayan races with the added Carl von Linnaeus descriptive peculiarities became the subsequent basis of most 19th century anthropomedical studies. While Carl von Linnaeus founded his system principally upon skin color, Blumenbach considered a combination of color, hair, skull, and facial characteristics as fundamental means for classifying the five varieties of man. Central to his study was the Caucasian, a term which he originated. He took the name Caucasian, listen, for the science, from Mount Caucasus because its southern slope had cradled what he felt to be the most beautiful race of men, the Georgian. The Caucasus near Mount Ararat, upon which the biblical ark came to rest after the flood, seemed the appropriate source for the original race of man. No science yet. Now I'm going to quote him. These are his words. For in the first place, the stock displays, as we have seen, the most beautiful form of the skull, from which is a mean and primeval type the others diverge by most easy gradations on both sides the two ultimate extremes. That is, on the one side, the Mongolian, on the other, the Ethiopian. Besides, it is white in color. Anybody here ever met a skull that wasn't? Besides, it is white in color, which we may fairly assume to have been the primitive color of mankind. zippity doo da, no science, nothing to found this whole thing. He figured white skull, humanity began white. It's scary, but it's in a book, and it's touted as science, and we swallowed it without question. But race is a concept of society that insists there is genetic significance behind human variations in skin color that transcends outward appearance. However, race has no, thank you, has no scientific merit outside of sociological classifications. There are no significant genetic variations within the human species to justify the division of races. Mankind is one. We are one humanity. Isn't it a shame that we are still debating that in 2008? But the reason why we continue to debate it is we still try to reconcile the ugly stuff that we've never dealt with. We still want to say they deserved it, so no one has to feel bad about all of those little babies dying, and ignoring the ravages of Africa, and killing young black males, and urban cities all the in disproportionate imprisonment and disproportionate disparities in health oh it must be their fault how do you reconcile it you see rather than deal with it we we just continue to try to, to justify the behavior thomas jefferson you all know him Yes, he's one of my favorite people, actually. I close out my book with a soliloquy from Thomas Jefferson. I actually end my book with it. Because Thomas Jefferson made a statement. Here's a man highly regarded in the United States. I mean, there are more statues of him than probably anybody. And he made a statement towards the end of his life. He says, indeed, I tremble for my country when I consider that God is just and that his justice cannot sleep forever. You see, it haunted him to his grave because Thomas Jefferson knew. He knew what would happen. Matter of fact, he predicted exactly what we're dealing with today, what happened between people of African descent and those of European descent. Predicted it. He was a bright man. How do you reconcile behaving in such a barbaric way? Well, let's see what he said. He said uh, blacks smelled bad and were physically unattractive. Well, this was inconsistent with his behavior because, you know, he fathered slaves, Sally Hemings. So it didn't smell that bad, huh? Now, here's a more important one. He said we required less sleep. Now, that one's more interesting to me. Why would he need to? What dissonance was he feeling that he would need to believe that blacks required less sleep? Why? What did he do? You know, he owned slaves. So what do you think? How hard do you think he worked them? 
What was the work day for a slave? Sunrise to sunset. But do you have any empirical evidence, Joy? Can you prove that? Because you know, can't, if, if you can't write, you know, count it and measure it, it didn't happen in European culture. Is that correct? You gotta count it and measure it. How many of you have measurable objectives? Measurable outcomes, you better measure it. I don't care if you tell them. Can you tell your boss really, truly, at the end of the year, we're doing better now? I've been to work every single day I've watched and I can guarantee you we're doing better. Is that gonna fly? That would be no. That means you have to count it and measure it. And if you didn't count and measure, it didn't happen. So when you start looking at the notion of requiring less sleep, that's an interesting thing because I have to believe if I work you that hard. And boy, I, I got humbled when I found out how hard folks worked in the sugar plantations. Ooh wee, I got humbled by how hard folks in the Caribbean were worked. But what I decided to do is I looked at the Library of Congress. Most of my work over the nine years that it took to write the book, six years of that was research. The other part of it had to do with doing um, interviews of elders and reading slave narratives, and there are thousands of them. This is just one taken from the Library of Congress. Sarah Gudger from North Carolina wrote, never know nothing but work, never knew rest, felt like my back was gonna break. This the gospel truth. Then I looked at uh, what happened in the sugar plantations, and this was amazing. One final set of grim numbers underlines the way slaves on sugar plantations like Codrington, uh, which is a plantation in Barbados, were systematically worked to an early death. When slavery ended in the United States, slaves imported over the centuries had grown to a population of nearly four million. When it ended in the British West Indies, total slave imports of well over two million left a surviving slave population of only about 670,000. More than twice as many slaves were shipped to the island of Jamaica alone than all 13 uh, North American colonies combined. The Caribbean was a slaughterhouse. In fact, the reason why there was more importation of slaves to these plantations is because they died so frequently. They were treated so badly, ate so poorly, that females never reached their menstrual cycles. They never actually started their menstrual cycles, so they couldn't reproduce, you see. And so many of them died, they had to import more. That's how treacherous it was, you lazy black folks that you are. Isn't that ironic, though? Through the time of the Reconstruction, the terrorism that blacks faced under the hand of white supremacy did not stop with the government-funded institutionalized slavery, beatings, floggings, lynchings, and murders, but also in the medical field. During this tumultuous times, doctors and nurses were carrying out medical experiments on the Negro population, a type of medical apartheid, if you will. During this time period, groups like the Eugenics Society of America was formed. Most people, when they think of eugenics, it spurs thoughts of Hitler, concentration camps and the pursuit of the Aryan race, the Ubermensch or Superman that he allegedly tried to develop through genetic elimination and crossbreeding. But the true origin of eugenics is much more deeper and darker. See Hitler was just an understudy. Everything that Hitler knew he learned it from the American eugenics program. The Eugenics Society of America first objective was to sterilize the entire Negro population and where sterilization would not work, termination would. This government-funded program was originally called the Negro Project, was eventually became to be known as Planned Parenthood. Founder Margaret Sanger had the following thing to say about the Negro. Colored people are like human weeds that need to be exterminated, Margaret Sanger. And when asked about our program, she answered, we don't want the word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. In a letter to Dr. Clarence Gamble in December 19, 1939, Sanger exposed their vision for the Negro Project, a freshly launched collaboration between the American Birth Control League and Sanger's Birth Control Clinical Research Bureau. The letter echoes the eugenic ideologies still visible in the corporate vein of Planned Parenthood today. Quote, we should hire three or four colored ministers preferably with social service backgrounds, with engaging personalities. The most successful education approach to the Negro is through a religious appeal. In the early 1900s, the American Eugenic Society brought in religious people by promoting eugenic sermons. 
In doing this, they paid preachers hundreds of dollars to submit the best eugenics sermon and preach it from the pulpit, enabling the eugenics movement to indoctrinate the church. Many religious groups found eugenics a welcome addition to their existing charity work and social services. The minister's work is also important, and also he should be trained, perhaps by the Federation, as to our ideals and the goal that we hope to reach. We do not want word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population, and the minister is the man who can straighten out that idea if it ever occurs to any of their more rebellious members. In 1939, Margaret Sanger wrote that in a letter to fellow eugenicist Clarence Gamble regarding the American Birth Control League's Negro Project. Gamble was an heir to the Procter & Gamble fortune and a major financial backer of Sanger's. He also provided funding for other eugenics projects and even gave money directly to the North Carolina Eugenics Board that sterilized Elaine Riddick. In fact, in 1947, he called for the expansion of that state's sterilization program, saying that for every feeble-minded person sterilized, 40 more were polluting and degrading the bloodlines of future generations with their defective genes. Sanger's letter makes it clear that the eugenics movement understood they would need to neutralize the opposition they might get from the church. They also knew that this would be especially crucial within the African-American community. Their strategy was to manipulate church leadership into selling the illusion that support for eugenics was not inconsistent with the Christian faith. To do this, they would often recruit pastors to be front men for eugenics policies and provide them with prepackaged sermons on eugenics. They also held contests in which awards would be given to the ministers who came up with the best pro-eugenics sermons on their own. This approach proved so effective that an almost identical strategy would be adopted by the American abortion lobby. I have seen the news media literally hide their trucks so that they would not be in a position to have to cover the demonstrations in front of Cobo Hall, only to bring them out after the demonstrators had left. This is an outrage that the black community is having the life of its babies destroyed and the NAACP and the media are knowingly conspiring to keep this information from the public. This is an outrage and it should be dealt with by every fair-minded American. We look at this issue of civil rights leaders who sell out even when they clearly know that birth control and abortion are being used for black genocide. We need to understand that by the 1960s population control, especially black population control, had become almost a religion for America's white power structure. And from the start, they made it clear that if you crossed them, or if you challenged their agenda, they would chop you off at the knees. And that remains true to this day. Whether you're talking about the liberal social engineers who control the Democratic Party, or the wealthy elitists who control the Republican Party, or the media, or the academic community, these people have created a kind of family planning cartel that does not tolerate dissent. And they have always been especially ruthless about this when it comes to African Americans. A perfect example of this was seen in the case of Samuel Yett. Mr. Yett was an award-winning journalist who had earned a master's degree from Indiana University, was a U.S. Air Force veteran of the Korean War, and served as special assistant for civil rights to the director of the U.S. Office of Economic Opportunity. He was also a professor of journalism, at Howard University and a columnist for several magazines and newspapers. In 1968, Yet had become the first African-American reporter hired by Newsweek magazine and he quickly became their Washington, D.C. bureau correspondent. But then three years later, he wrote a book that exposed high-level plans within the United States to use birth control and abortion as instruments of black genocide. Then immediately after his book was released to the public, yet was called into his supervisor's office and fired. At that meeting, he was informed that his dismissal had been orchestrated by the Nixon White House. The next year, yet told the New York Times that pressure had been put on Newsweek to get him out of Washington. Then later, despite the fact that his book was selling well, had received at least two national awards and was being used as a textbook in over 100 colleges. 
Getz publisher dropped him and the book went off the market. What's important to recognize about this situation and others like it was that this family planning cartel was sending a message to those who might have influence within the African American community. Whether they were politicians or journalists or college professors or civil rights leaders, they were being warned that when it comes to population control, they only had two options. They could either get on board with it or they could keep their mouths shut. And when people like Samuel Yet told them what they could do with their two options, they paid a price that few others had the character or the courage to pay. Just in case you thought that line of thought was exclusive to Sanger, here are some quotes from a fellow eugenicist. We have them as the greatest problem and most destructive force which confronts the white race and the American civilization. The best way to hate a nigga is to hate him before he's born. The Enterprise. Non-white races must be excluded from America. The red and black races, if left to themselves, revert to a savage or semi-savage state in a short time. Lothrop Strader, director of the American Birth Control League. The black man has never been a competitor, but has always been subservient to the white race. And just so long as he remains subservient, his position is secure. And just soon as he becomes a competitor, his fate is sealed. Dr. Benjamin Hayes, Eugenesis. Even during the Nixon administration, President Nixon was caught on tape discussing the need to control the black mortality rate. In January of 1973, the Supreme Court legalized abortion on demand throughout the United States, and almost immediately, the Religious Coalition for Abortion Rights was formed. Less than a year earlier, the following conversation had taken place in the Oval Office of the White House. It began on the 30th of March, 1972, and continued four days later on the 3rd of April. This is an actual recording of that conversation. The speakers are the President of the United States, Republican Richard Nixon, and members of his senior staff. The majority of people in Colorado voted for abortion. I think the majority of people in the nation voted for abortion. I think in both cases, both states, the majority of people voted for abortion because they think the question would be aborted generally or the little black subjects. Coalition for Abortion Rights was originally created with the financial backing of John Rockefeller, and its current president is an African American who was once appointed to the Washington, D.C. City Council by Richard Nixon. In the early 1990s, the organization changed its name and is today known as the Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice. In 1969, a meeting of the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, also known as UNESCO, proposed that an American Population Commission be created with a, quote, large budget for propaganda, unquote. Four months later, Republican President Richard Nixon signed legislation establishing the Commission on Population Growth and the American Future. The bill authorizing this new initiative had been passed with overwhelming support from congressional Democrats and was chaired by John Rockefeller. The executive director of the project was to be Dr. Charles F. Westhoff, who was also a member of both the American Eugenics Society and Planned Parenthood's National Advisory Council. Another member of this new commission was Dr. Joseph Beasley. 
In the 1960s, Beasley oversaw an aggressive eugenics program that concentrated on black neighborhoods in New Orleans with the stated intention of lowering welfare costs. This project would eventually be described by Planned Parenthood President Alan Guttmacher as the number one success story in the history of American birth control movement. It also led to Beasley being elected chairman of the board of Planned Parenthood in 1970. Then in 1975, Beasley was sent to federal prison for conspiring to defraud the U.S. government of $778,000. During the time of establishing these institutions, like the Eugenic Society of America, blacks were not only sterilized or aborted, but also experimented on. Blacks were injected without their knowledge or consent with all types of diseases, such as yellow fever, smallpox, malaria, and syphilis. Doctors ran tests on experimental drugs and risky surgical procedures, which involved what amounted to be tortures and maimings. These horrific practices were justified under their white supremacist pseudoscience, that taught that blacks were incapable of feeling pain and resisted to fatigue and from overworking and heat exhaustion. Not just like James Marion Sims, who believed that black babies, because of their race, could bear great pain, which makes them suitable for medical experiments. James Marion is considered a father of modern gynecology for his invention of the vaginal speculum, a tool used to open a woman's vagina. A white racist supremacist who experimented with black slave women and newborn baby infants. He received medals for his work from a makeshift hospital he created in his backyard. Interested in Trismus nascentium, essentially lockjaw and infants, Sim began experimenting on the infants born as slave women. Although it's now known to be the result of unsanitary practices and nutritional deficiencies, Sim attributed Trismus to intellectual flaws and indecencies of blacks with the skull formation at birth. To test this, Sim used a shoemaker's awl to pry the skull bones of the babies into alignment. These experiments had a 100% fatality rate. These barbaric practices needed justification, so to remove the cognitive dissidents, new medical conditions were established. Enter Samuel A. Cartwright. Cartwright diagnosed two conditions, drectomania and dysthesis aethiopica. Drectomania is allegedly a mental condition that causes blacks to want to be free from captivity. Cartwright prescribed whipping the devil out of them as a preventative measure. As a remedy for this disease, doctors also made running a physical impossibility by prescribing the removal of both big toes. Dysothesa aethiopica, on the other hand, is an illness that allegedly causes laziness in slaves. Carwright felt that it was easily curable if treated on sound physiological principles. Insensitivity of the skin was one symptom of this disease, so the skin should be stimulated. He felt like the best means to stimulate the skin is first to have the patient well washed with warm soap and water, then anoint them all over in oil and slap the oil with a broad leather strap. Then put the patient to some hard work in the sunshine. These insane constructs became the backbone of their reasoning for the extermination of black life. Now, let's talk about Abraham Lincoln. The one through the 13th Amendment, the 14th and the 15th, but the 13th Amendment that he freed the slaves that all our hard and bad days was over. We moving forward. We finna move into the promised land because good old Abe, he came by seen our, our atrocities and had compassion on us and began to write the 13th Amendment that freed all of us so we must honor him, respect him, and, and, and even want it in our mentality to give him his own day. Put him on a black history list. Now, let's really look at what Abraham Lincoln really thought of people of color and what his thinking was concerning the Emancipation Proclamation, the 13th Amendment. Let's look into the things that he spoke of himself. Abraham Lincoln, named the great emancipator and champion of the Constitution by government school textbooks, was more concerned with exercising federal control over sovereign states than he was in freeing the Negro from the shackles of slavery. He himself made this clear in no uncertain terms. On March 4th, 1861, 
Lincoln clarified his position on slavery in his first inaugural address on the east portico of the Capitol building. Quote, I have no purpose directly or indirectly to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. I believe I have no lawful right to do so, and I have no inclination to do so. While America's children continue to be brainwashed into believing that Lincoln was the savior of the black man, the congressman from Illinois tells a different tale in his fourth debate with Stephen Douglas at Charleston, Illinois on September 18, 1858. Quote, I will say then that I am not nor ever have been in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the white and black races. I am not now nor ever have been in favor of making voters or jurors of Negroes, nor of qualifying them to hold office, nor to intermarry with white people. And I will say in addition to this that there is a physical difference between the white and black races which I believe will forever forbid the two races living together on terms of social and political equality. And inasmuch as they cannot so live, while they do remain together, there must be the position of superior and inferior. And I, as much as any other man, am in favor of having the superior position assigned to the white race. The long list of Lincoln's recorded remarks, which would readily and fervently be condemned as racist hate speech today, includes his views on the expansion of slavery. Lincoln wrote, quote, there is a natural disgust in the minds of nearly all white people to the idea of indiscriminate amalgamation, that is mixture, of the white and black races. A separation of the races is the only perfect preventative of amalgamation. But as an immediate separation is impossible, the next best thing is to keep them apart where they're not already together. If white and black people never get together in Kansas, they will never mix blood in Kansas. On equality, Lincoln said, quote, I have no purpose to introduce political and social equality between the white and black races. There's physical difference between the two which, in my opinion, will probably forever forbid their living together upon the footing of perfect equality, and inasmuch as it becomes a necessity that there must be a difference, I, as well as Judge Douglas, am in favor of the race to which I belong, having the superior position." End quote. On interracial marriage, Lincoln said, "...our Republican system was meant for a homogenous people. As long as blacks continue to live with the whites, they constitute a threat to the national life. Family life may also collapse, and the increase of mixed breed bastards may someday challenge the supremacy of the white man." End quote. Ironically, rather than freeing slaves, Lincoln, through the Enrollment Act, which conscripted men between the ages of 20 and 45 to be, quote, liable to perform military duty in the service of the United States, created a slave class to be used as enforcers of the federal will. Though many erroneously believe that the Civil War was fought primarily over the issue of slavery, that notion is undermined by the well-publicized letter written to the New York Tribune's editor Horace Greeley on August 22, 1862, during the heart of the actual battle. In it, Lincoln himself reveals his real reason for initiating the conflict when he wrote, quote, if I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. What I do about slavery and the colored race, I do because I believe it helps to save the Union." End quote. His focus was and had always been on saving or strengthening the Union and therefore the power of the federal government, not on extending a hand to lift the black man from the plight of his slavery. So we're able to see that good old Abe, when always good old Abe, was able to see that his main focus was not the compassion that he was supposed to have on us as a people because of slavery, but his main focus was saving the Union, because just as he said, if he could have saved the Union by leaving slavery as an institution, he would have done that. If he could have saved the Union by freeing every slave, he would have done that. If he could have saved the Union by freeing some slaves and making some slaves still uh, pre uh, participate in chattel slavery, he would have done that. He said the things that I allow or disallow is based on the saving 
owner of the union, not the compassion for the slaves. So we're able to see what his mindset was, right? So let's look at another uh, little part because I said the number one uh, enemy of us is ignorance. Now, if we talk reparations, no, nobody want to have the reparation talk. But when you look at who all have received reparations, now a lot of uh, different uh, people went through a lot of things uh, through the hand of imperialism, through colonization, and they received reparations, right? So. Let's look at this long list of everybody that received reparations. And as you're able to see, let's see who was on there that didn't receive reparations, either or in, even all the way up until the day. At the very same time that America refused to give the Negro any land, through an act of Congress, our government was giving away millions of acres of land in the West and the Midwest meant that it was willing to undergird its white peasants from Europe with an economic floor. But not only did they give the land, they built land-grant colleges with government money to teach them how to farm. Not only that, they provided county agents to further their expertise in farming. Not only that, they provided low interest rates in order that they could mechanize their farms. Not only that, Today, many of these people are receiving millions of dollars in federal subsidies not to farm, and they are the very people telling the black man that he ought to lift himself by his own bootstraps. And this is what we are faced with, and this is a reality. Now, when we come to Washington in this campaign, we are coming to get our check. There's a lot said to whether or rather not certain groups of people should receive payments or reparations for the struggle, pain, or disenfranchisement. When we look over the history, we'll see that there's multiple peoples who have received payments for their pain. In 1990, the United States gave $1.6 billion to the Japanese Americans. Also in 1990, Austria gave $25 million to the Holocaust survivors. In 1988, Canada gave 250,000 square miles of land to the Indians and Eskimos. Also that year, they gave 230 million to the Japanese Canadians. In 1986, the United States of America gave 32 million dollars because of an 1839 treaty to the Ottawa's of Michigan. In 1985, the United States gave 31 million dollars to the Chippewas of Wisconsin. Also that year, 12.3 million to the Seminoles of Florida. Also, 105 million to the Sioux of South Dakota. In 1980, the United States gave 81 million dollars to the Commonwealth of Oregon. In 1971, the United States gave 1 billion dollars plus 44 million acres of land to the Alaska Natives in the land settlement. In 1952, Germany gave 822 million to Holocaust survivors. But from 1865 to present. For the African-American slaves who experienced genocide, terrorism, and slavery for close to 400 years, not a dime, not a single dollar. First came out of slavery, blacks, blacks were relatively successful because they understood the importance of one thing, and that, and that was to learn how to own and to control get resources because that was the whole purpose of slavery. Slavery was basically to maldistribute almost 100% of all this nation's wealth, resource, privileges, and controls all levels of government into the hands of the dominant white society. And it was very effective. It did an excellent job. And slavery, slavery came into existence in the 1500s. It had a very specific purpose. Slavery was an economic issue, not a social issue. And so black folk learned that even as slaves, they might not have been well educated, but they weren't stupid. They figured out that he who owns and controls has the power. And so when slavery ended in the 1860s, about 1866, at that point in time, you had, they learned something else from the radical Republicans who came out and said that, you, that black people in America can only be two, two, one or two things. Either you're gonna be slaves or you're gonna be free. To be free, you must minimally, these blacks must minimally, five million, almost five million blacks must minimally have 40 acres of mule and $100 given to them coming out of slavery if they're gonna play this game. Because at that time in slavery, black folk were the primary generators of wealth on the earth. 
This country had invested over $8 billion just into slavery. That was more money than all the businesses and all levels of government put together. And, they, and, and black folk as slaves, they knew the importance of wealth and owning and controlling. And they wanted that 40 acres and a mule and $100. And, uh, and Congressman Thaddeus Stevens, Charles Sumner, and Benjamin said that on the floor of the United States Congress in the 1865 Civil Rights Law. Give black folk 40 acres of mule and $100. And Andrew Johnson came and he became the president after Lincoln's assassination. He killed the bill. They came back again in 1866 again and said, black folk have to have resources to be able to compete. And then later on, they converted that to the 14th Amendment in 1868. But in the meantime, black folk left slavery, not only controlling anything. Black folk left slavery after four or five hundred years, penniless, poor, disorganized, no religion, no clothes, no food, no animals, no home, no land, no tools, no weapons, nothing and white folks told them to go out there and compete. And unfortunately, I was, our, our leadership didn't understand that. You cannot compete not owning anything. But a few blacks got the word. They said, what we have to do is try to get some of that land at 40 acres and a mule. So there was a study last year published by Social Science Quarterly that the estimated amount of reparations owed to African people in the U.S. is $14.2 trillion. White people owe reparations, but not only for the enslavement of Africans, we owe reparations for the ongoing colonization of Africans in the United States. And Yes Magazine, um, published this uh, really good story last year called 40 Acres in a Mule would be at least $6.4 trillion uh, today, in addition to $14.2 trillion for um, slavery. 40 Acres in a Mule would be at least $6.4 trillion uh, today, in addition to $14.2 trillion for um, The United Nations affiliated group, the Working Group of Experts on People of African Descent, has released a 22-page report calling on the U.S. to provide reparations for African Americans and a formal apology for slavery and the Jim Crow laws. The group stated that the country is not acting with the due diligence to protect the rights of African Americans, as evidenced by the lack of gun control and stand-your-ground laws, among other things. Even though the group has official ties to the U.N., Ted Picone, a senior fellow at Brookings Institute, said, UN reports like these are not binding or given much visibility in the U.S. The U.S. government has ignored the UN in the past, including the Committee of the Elimination of Racial Discriminations report in 2014 that included recommendations to prohibit racial discrimination and all its forms in federal and state legislation, including indirect discrimination, covering all fields of law and public life. Let's have this talk again about reparations because we was able to see who all received reparations because of what happened to them. And some that America was not even a part of but American giving the Jewish people reparations. But when we talk about our reparations, everybody want to be quiet. But we know that our number one enemy is what? Ignorance. Now let's look at who did receive reparations through something that is called the District of Columbia Emancipation Act. This is an act where slave masters petitioned the government for the Emancipation Proclamation that the freeing of slaves that they petitioned the government to receive reparations for the slaves that they lost in the District of Columbia. And do you not know that Abraham Lincoln signed that bill and gave them reparation for each slave that they lost? So let's look into this into an even greater level. Let's read it. On April the 16th, 1862, President Abraham Lincoln signed a bill in the slavery in the District of Columbia. The passage of this law came eight and a half months before President Lincoln issued his Emancipation Proclamation. They had bought a conclusion of decades of agitation that aimed at ending what anti-slavery advocates called the national chain of slavery in the nation's capital. It provided for immediate emancipation, compensation to former owners who were loyal to the Union 
up to $300 for each slave. So if you was loyal to the union in that area and the district, you were rewarded $300 for each slave. Like I said, our number one enemy is ignorance. All right, so the 13th Amendment, let's really look at it and dissect it and see what slavery really ended. Now, I encourage you to get a book called Slavery by Another Name. It's by the author Douglas A. Blackman. And in this book, he shows that slavery went from one institution into another. So now, let's look at the 13th Amendment and let's see if we can understand what slavery by another name meant. Buried in old courthouses, abandoned jails, libraries, and archives all across the South are tens of thousands of public documents and letters written by African Americans at the turn of the last century. Mr. President, I have a brother about 14 years old. A man hired him for me and I heard of him no more. He went and sold him to McCree and they has been working him in prison for 12 months. He's done nothing wrong for them to keep him in chains. Written more than 40 years after the Emancipation Proclamation, these letters bear witness to a sinister and little-known chapter in American history. Whenever one is in a conversation where someone says, what's wrong with black people? Why can't they get over it? Slavery ended 150 years ago. That's fundamentally false. The reality is that slavery and all of the, the limitations that it imposed on the future and the potential and the progress of African American families, it didn't end 150 years ago. It continued until World War II, well into the lives of large numbers of African Americans today. For more than 80 years following the Civil War, hundreds of thousands of African Americans in the South were pulled back into the shadow of slavery. buying and selling African Americans ended with the 13th Amendment, but that did not translate into actual freedom. One of the fascinating things about the text of that amendment is that it says that slavery is abolished except in the case of a punishment for a crime. With emancipation, the nature of both crime and punishment in the South changed dramatically. In state after state, county after county, Laws were passed to criminalize black life. It was a crime in the South for a farm worker to walk beside a railroad. It was a crime in the South to speak loudly in the company of white women. It was a crime to sell the products of your farm after dark. But the most damaging of all of these laws were the vagrancy statute. In every southern state, you became a criminal if you could not prove at any given moment that you were employed. Once arrested, convicts released and forced to labor in coal mines, lumber camps, brick factories, and turpentine farms. They were shackled, imprisoned, and tortured, sometimes to the point of death. The fact that blacks were treated the way they were, like animals. People could be just picked up and put in jail. They could be lost in the system. Nobody knew how to find them. They could be buried in some grave somewhere and families still looking for them. Don't know where they are. I didn't know that the sheriff department could sell slaves to corporation steel plants and coal mines. The constant threat of arrest and forced labor, like the threat of lynching, cast a shadow over the South. Slavery had ended, but true freedom had not begun. Now we're able to see through the understanding of the 13th Amendment, well, what it was truly saying, or slavery by another name, we was able to see that slavery now had been outlawed unless it was punishment for a crime. And we now we have understood what convict leasing was, where now I don't have to care about my slave now. 
because what when one dies I could just have crimes out there remember the black codes and the black laws and the pig laws and different stuff that we just went over now I can just grab me another one make more laws on them and grab me another slave so now I can work them in coal mines and, and, and they can work from sun up to sundown I can still beat them I can still whoop them I can still discipline them everything was still the same but now slavery was punishment for a crime and now the laws have been set up against the people like we see even vagrancy laws that have been set up against the people that if you don't even have a job you could be convicted of a crime so the convict leasing system and debt peonage and all these things lasted all the way up from 1865 all the way up to 1942 so what in particular happened in 1942 to get these things completely dissolved from happening in the United States out in the open what happened did the government look at this these situations and have compassion on people of color and just say we got to stop this this stuff is not right we got to outlaw the outlaw these things what happened in 1942 in 1942 an act called it circular 3591 Act. Now let's look at it and let's see what that is. The Circular 3591, dated December 12, 1941, enabled authorities across the country to finally break the backs of involuntary servitude. This documented order used constitutional amendments and various reconstruction laws to persecute individuals suspected of holding people under forced labor conditions. Whereas previous prosecutions failed due to lack of evidence of debt peonage in cases. The new direction would concentrate on violations of forceful bondage. The Circular 3591 provided the necessary legal framework to effectively close the loopholes on slavery in this country. As such, December 12, 1941, while not typically acknowledged among more prominent events, is a date that changed the lives of African Americans and Americans in general. Now on the surface, it seems as though the Circle of 3591 Act was a conscious decision by the American government to stop the systematic eradication and enslaving of blacks in America. But if you look a little closer, you'll see the underlying motive. See, as the act was developed on December 12, 1941, there was a major event that happened that hastened the need for manpower just four days before the sign of the Circular 3591. On December 7, 1941, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, thrusting the United States into World War II. Blacks in the South were still living under treacherous conditions of reconstituted slavery with no foreseeable means to end the practice. The bombing of Pearl Harbor forced President Franklin D. Roosevelt to address the horrendous circumstances of blacks in the South, as it would be an international embarrassment. Despite the continuing discrimination, more than a million African Americans volunteered to serve in the armed forces to fight against Hitler. So we're able to see the circular uh, 3591 at it happened not because they have compassion on people of color but because a war was going on so now the country only get united when I need you to help me in a war remember our number one enemy is ignorance so now let's move on and show more of history so we can get a more greater of an understanding of where we at what happened and what we need to do to move forward all right, so now we're moving forward into another aspect of America's dark history of showing that something that is called the rat experiment and it's called um, the project. So now what happened, we have a, a scientist or a professor of a man named uh, John Calhoun and the government paid him to do the study. And what they wanted to see, what would be the response of rats been put in one place of overcrowding, feeding them with a surplus of food, and also what would be their response if you would limit their food and have steal them in those uh, those different places and see what their response would be. And uh, through his findings and through his observation, he was able to see that the male rats became overly aggressive. They began to move in groups. The mothers began to neglect as food was limited and began to neglect their children. Um, they seemed like they was careless about those children. Uh, they had even some rats that became hypersexual, some became pansexual, some became homosexual. So they began to see a shift 
and the way that the mice begin to respond to each other and seeing an over aggressiveness of them killing it killing each other and begin also to see how they responded of a family begin how they responded with love for each other when things were scarce and when things was limited but things were still overcrowded and this experiment was called the project now don't that sound familiar as the government funded it this is what we know today as the projects and this is what we know as the term where we get the term from hood rat it all derived from the inception of this Mr. Catoon's research that evolved over time that were able to show the government the response of what rats would do. At first they begin to study the animals and then they study the people. This is what we know today as uh, the projects and we begin to see that this was a stepping stone in order to bring people of color into one area, overcrowd it, begin to limit their resources, uh, uh, give them surplus of resources at time and they knew that they would begin to give this type of response. The same response that the animals gave that they began begin to move in groups overly aggressive, began to harm each other, mothers not caring as much for their children, seeing carelessness. So that's the same study that was funded by the government began to play out in reality. So now let's move forward and see um, even to a greater level what this study have done. After the Circular 3591 Act, many blacks went off to fight for their country in World War II. In 1944, the United States government signed the GI Bill, giving World War II veterans guaranteed loans for housing. Many blacks returned home with thoughts of the American dream and having high hopes of a better life, only to have their hopes smashed and their dreams crushed. When the reality set in that America still doesn't accept them as full citizens with equal rights. We came to Levittown and we found the model house and we walked in and we looked around and uh, of course in the eyes of a uh, young man who was raised in the ghetto so to speak it was an interesting experience interesting lifestyle seeing all the new modern conveniences very fascinating eugene burnett came home with almost a million other black gi's they had fought for the country in segregated ranks. They returned hoping for equality and the American dream. For many, that dream was a new home for little money down and some of the easiest credit terms in history. I went up to the salesman, we're interested in your home, we're interested in buying one, and uh, what is the procedure? Is there an application to be filled out? So forth, so he looked at me, looked around, and he said to me, he says, listen, it's not me, but the owners of this development have not as yet decided to sell these homes to Negroes. It was as though it wasn't real. You can't imagine. But for someone to come out and actually tell you that they can't sell to you. You know, I, I was really on an up. Man, look at this house. Can you imagine having this? And then for them to tell me because of the color of my skin, I can't be a part of it. The FHA underwriters warned that the presence of even one or two non-white families could undermine real estate values in the new suburbs. These government guidelines were widely adopted by private industry. Race had long played a role in local real estate practices. Starting in the 1930s, government officials institutionalized the national appraisal system, where race was as much a factor in real estate assessment as the condition of the property. Using this scheme, Federal investigators evaluated 239 cities across the country for financial risk. So that those communities that were all white, suburban, and far away from minority areas, uh, they received the highest rating, and that was the color green. Those communities that were all minority or in the process of changing 
they got the lowest rating and the color red. They were redlined. As a consequence, most of the mortgages went to suburbanizing America, and it suburbanized it racially. The racial logic adopts the principle that an integrated neighborhood is a bad risk, is a financial risk, that an integrated neighborhood is likely to be an unstable neighborhood, uh, unstable socially, but therefore also unstable economically. When the white residents of Eight Mile Road in Detroit were told they were too close to a black neighborhood to qualify for a positive FHA rating, they built this six-foot wall between themselves and their black neighbors. Once the wall went up, mortgages on the white properties were approved. Between 1934 and 1962, the federal government underwrote $120 billion in new housing. Less than 2% went to non-whites. I can understand an individual, depending on his environment or his family or whatever, uh, being racist, but for your country to um, sanction it, give him tools to do that. There's something deadly wrong there. The making of Newark's riot actually begins a full generation before the riots actually hit. You know, I think we often mistakenly believe that it's natural that the inner cities be problematic and the suburbs be pristine in the United States, but um, it wasn't really so much God or nature that decided that. It's human decisions. Mainly through federal housing transportation policy. Newark was destined to become a city mainly of poor people, mainly of black people, where more and more upwardly mobile whites would be encouraged to actually leave the city. After World War II, and certainly throughout the 50s, the whole image of the suburbs was pushed. You haven't arrived until you get to the suburbs, until you have your backyard, until you have your front yard, and maybe two cars. You know, suburban tracks, were, were subsidized by the federal government, you know, and the highways were subsidized by the federal government. 1945 until really into the 70s, the suburbs were white territory, thanks to government action. It was not just white flight, it was also white people taking advantage who wouldn't of very uh, advantageous lending policies. These things had not been available before the war to a wide segment of Americans. They were not available to black people. You had the bank redlining under Roosevelt. Actually created maps where they literally drew red lines around a block with the presence of just one black person or one Jewish person would be enough to literally redline a block on the map, which meant there would be no mortgages given on those blocks. Newark is written off by the people who are making these decisions. So they're really saying that Newark is not a good place for the federal government to invest. The suburbs are. Block busting, real estate developers have busted up blocks because you know one black family might move in, scare tactics to get whites to sell cheap and then sell high to the blacks who moved in. The pitch was, hey, you know, these colored people are moving in. You, you better sell now before your, your house value goes all the way down. And you get these people just to get scared. They'd sell their house slow. But then those blacks who moved in weren't getting any bank loans. They wouldn't get any insurance on those homes. So that led to conditions which deterioration of much of the wood stick housing that uh, Newark had. So it was, you know, <laughs> disgusting but fascinating from an economic point of view. When I grew up in the 50s, I can recall in my neighborhood, there were always places where people can get pretty decent jobs and establish yourself, have some kind of stability economically. Throughout the 50s, as many of these companies, they moved to southern New Jersey or southern United States until finally, you know, we're at the point where, uh, you know, companies just, global monopoly capitalism just will take it wherever, it, you know, they can make the most money. So, here are a bunch of black folks up here looking for jobs in the industrial sector. Suddenly they got here and there was nothing here. It was like an old bait and switch route. All of those led to conditions that resulted in, you know, poor housing and poor health care and less job opportunities, which were why people felt disenfranchised. They were destabilized economically. 
And all those things were what led to Newark in 67 or Detroit in 67 or, or what? Now we're able to see that through the hood rat, through the rat experiment, the formulation of the projects, and we begin to see that the FHA or the government legislated ghettos into existence and restricted them from being able to develop as families and come out of those ghettos. And now what happens when you have that type of despair, when you have that type of um, uh, different things that are going on collectively to come against these people and you throw drugs in the midst of that? Because we understand that no young man has the resources to get drugs from all over the world and formulate. He is the source that he's getting these drugs from. Now what happens when you throw that into the mix? Now I, 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 I can remember now, I think of a time that I had jury duty. And in his jury duty, a police officer was letting us know about a young uh, drug dealer that he had been trying to get for a while and they was able to catch him finally when he was coming back from Atlanta when he was going to get some more product. So they finally got the drug dealer brought him back to Augusta and in between Atlanta and Augusta. And I asked him, I said, well, did you track his source away where he was getting his drugs from? And you know, the officer looked at me and told me, well, he said, no, it was not my job to find out where his source was coming from. It was my job to find him. So that would make me see a look at that their overall war on drugs is not to find the source of how drugs is coming into this country. But their job is just to arrest the people that are selling the drugs. Because if you find out the source from, well, all over the world where these drugs are being imported into these neighborhoods, being imported into America, you can stop the war on drugs instantly. But if I, as America, is producing the drugs and infusing the drugs into these black neighborhoods it's a reason that i'm doing it and now we get to the part where the cia we'll find out that the cia produced and brought drugs into this into this country now let's look at the dark alliance let's look at an interview of gary webb and let's go into and see this truth come out we'll be back right after this We're talking today, this is really a show about what we can call rumors. The rumor that the CIA was involved in making sure that cocaine made it to the streets of South Central LA back in the early 80s and then helped to develop and turn it into crack, which was then spread across America and is the reason why most of our inner cities are in the plight that they are in. And a lot of this has been out there for years, but it wasn't until recently that the story broke again. And my next guest is a reporter, not from San Diego, California, but from San Jose Mercury News. And he wrote a story called The Dark Alliance. Please welcome Mr. Gary Webb to the show. And Gary, this, this really, I think the, the current fervor over this issue is because of your article. A lot of people may not be familiar with what The Dark Alliance meant and stands for. Why don't you tell America what the story is about first, and then we'll okay. talk about the issues. This is about, it was about a cocaine ring that operated along the west coast of the United States uh, throughout most of the 80s. And they were funneling, um, they were selling cocaine in South Central, they were also selling it in Oakland, they were selling it in San Francisco, they were selling it in San Jose. Um, and some of the money they were making was going to support an army that the men who ran the cocaine ring worked for called the FDN. This was an army that the CIA started in 1981 and supported. Better known to us, most of us who remember news, the Contras. In Nicaragua, so go right ahead. The men that were running the cocaine ring were top officials of this Contra army. And what we found was that um, they were selling this stuff in South Central, which is you know, a predominantly black section of Los Angeles, immediately before the outbreak of the crack cocaine epidemic. They started selling powder, tons and tons and tons of powder cocaine was going into this one small area of the city. And from there, they sold it to Freeway Rick. And Freeway Rick took the powder, turned it into crack, and um, starting in 18, 1983, 1984, began distributing it to predominantly the, the gangs, the, the Crips and the Bloods in Los Angeles, and they spread it, you know, from there. From there. Now, this since, since this has happened, you have you have butted heads with everybody in Washington D.C. trying to get information about the story. Have you not? Yeah, we 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 worked on this for a year. And um, it was only because, you know, some people at National Archives believe freedom of information means freedom of information. And we got some documents that showed that 
pretty strongly that there were some CIA connections. To the Let's firm. talk a little bit about those documents for a second. Because there's a gentleman in this figure that we talked about yesterday on the show. His name is Blandone. Uh, Danilo Blandone, who was a person who was a member of the aristocracy of Nicaragua before the fall of Somoza, and then he fled and comes to the United States and decides while he's in the United States, so you can all understand this, he wants to raise money for the revolutionaries who are trying to overthrow the government that just overthrew them. So here in the United States, they try to do fundraisers and that doesn't work, and then Blandone gets a scheme, well, I can get some cocaine cheaply, with some help from some of my friends and get it into the United States of America, all I need to find is somebody who can sell it. So they find a gentleman by the name of Rick Ross, who is Freeway Rick. Rick Ross comes in and starts selling cocaine at the terms beginning one or two grams. And within weeks, two, three, four kilos a week. Within months, spread like wildfire in the early 1980s. And in Los Angeles, a drug dealer known as Freeway Ricky Ross was in the middle of it. Prosecutors called Ross the Walmart of crack. He made millions in the early 80s dealing to Los Angeles street gangs. Police say he was among the first to take expensive cocaine powder and cook it into low-cost, highly addictive crack, then distribute it through the gangs. Webb says Freeway Ricky helped trigger an epidemic of human misery. I'm a blood soldier boy. It's destroyed our community. All the black men are in prison, most of us. Rick Ross is now serving a life sentence for cocaine distribution. The women are still strung on the drugs, kids without fathers, without mothers. And honestly, how much responsibility do you have for that? A lot. A lot of it was my fault. I played, I played the game. Police in Los Angeles say he virtually cornered the crack market thanks to a steady supply of cheap cocaine. A pipeline so good that Ross was able to introduce crack to other cities using his gang contacts and to make himself, he says, a very rich man. On your best day, how much money did you see? <clears throat> a couple million, two, three maybe. On a day? On a good day. How many days like that were there? A few. Quite a few. Rick Ross's drug supplier did have connections. The bottom of one common theory, you've got to go back to the Cold War of the 1980s. The Iran-Contra scandal was brewing and would eventually enrage the American public. The United States government had funneled $18 million from a secret $30 million arms deal with Iran into the Nicaraguan Contra Revolutionary Group in an attempt to depose the socialist Sandinista government. The ensuing investigation unveiled something else unexpected. Many, many, many documents were released from the Iran-Contra era that showed that the CIA was deeply involved in drug smuggling all over the United States and throughout Central and South America. I was being groomed to be in a position where I could say yay or nay to search warrants. And that's when it became clear to me that the, the Central Intelligence Agency was actively protecting certain large drug shipments and that's when I drew the line and I said I wouldn't compromise my honor. Rob Bonner is a friend of mine uh, throughout the first George Bush administration said, documented that yes the, the CIA was involved with the importation of a fair amount of cocaine uh, with regard to the Iran Contra etc. But it just has to happen because of the money. Let me understand what you're saying. A ton of cocaine was smuggled into the United States of America. Well, went in Nicaragua in the middle 80s. Now it is alleged the CIA also helped the Contras raise money for arms by introducing crack cocaine into California. Deutsch felt he had to do something to try to uh, deal with the outrage that was foaming all over the country at the time. And of course, it just blew up in his face. CIA fights drugs. CIA does not encourage drugs. Well, I mean, it was, it was actually one of the most monumental blunders of all time, uh, if you think about it. We have no evidence of a conspiracy by the CIA to engage in encouraging drug traffickers in Nicaragua or elsewhere in Latin America. Deutsch was there because of the Gary Webb stories. The Gary Webb stories had sparked a national furor. I would like to have Richie Ross's uh, brother to speak, please. The United States government turned their head 
and let this cocaine come into the United States of America. Allow Gary Webb to have full access. This whole thing is orchestrated. It was near pandemonium. It was about, I guess, 1,200 people in a standing room only in the auditorium. 2,000 people outside listening on loudspeakers. And uh, it was very hard to keep control. I got called on finally, and I said to her very clearly, I was talking, looking right at Deutsch. I am a former Los Angeles police narcotics detective, and I work South Central Los Angeles, and I will tell you, Director Deutsch, that the agency has dealt drugs throughout this country for a long time. Uh, and I was able to name operations. Director Deutsch, I will refer you to three specific agency operations known as Amadeus, Pegasus, and Watchtower. I have Watchtower documents heavily redacted by the agency. I was personally exposed to CIA operations and recruited by CIA personnel who attempted to recruit me in the late 70s to become involved in protecting agency drug operations in this country. He stumbled and stammered and wrung his hands. If you have information about CIA illegal activity in drugs, you should immediately bring that information to wherever you want, but let me suggest three places. The Los Angeles Police Department. And of course my response was, I started there 18 years ago, sir, and they tried to kill me. Now what do you want me to do? If this information turns up wrongdoing, we will bring the people to justice and make them accountable. The crowd started chanting, we told you, we told you, we told you. And it was a great moment of unity. And it was a healing moment for me, because I'd been out alone for 18 years and didn't really know that, that that kind of support was there for me either. The average person in South Central Los Angeles did not know anything uh, about really how the CIA worked. They had an intuitive sense. That you have a private network run by George Bush and Ali North, not the CIA. You won't find the records in the CIA. They're not there. They're in these private privatized intelligence agencies. Will you pursue that? Will you pursue Ali North and George Bush and the, ever, the massive documentation? All these gentlemen, like this gentleman here, the co-defendant of Ricky Ross. They needed the money to finance the one nigga Wally. They had the link. We know that from records now that they sent Blando, who was a CIA operative, CIA, to school for marketing. Marketing the product, which we now know is cocaine. Me and Ricky Ross is waiting to get sentenced Tuesday. And she got, what, what, what a judge going to say to us come Tuesday? Uh, may I just say that the uh, question which was asked of us by the judge was, was Ricky Ross ever a agent or a contract employee? I already knew that from the beginning of, of, of dealing with the Nero Blandon that he was sending supplies and things of that nature, computers and guns to Nicaragua to fight a war. Ricky had already served a five and a half year sentence for dealing crack, but was now given a second 20 year sentence after being set up by his former partner Blandone, while Oliver North walked away as a hero, wealthy and free to try his hand at politics. Oliver North was uh, being promoted by the Christian Coalition, and to them he was the last white hope that uh, they were going to have for a right wing um, Christian to run for U.S. Senate in Virginia. During the 1986 Kerry Commission, Oliver North's crimes were exposed to the American public. And yet today, Oliver North is not only a free man, he has his own show on the Fox News Network. All right, so we see that the CIA infused drugs into the neighborhoods of black communities, creating more despair, uh, cre creating more problems, uh, creating more Im uh, imagery. Of, uh, of things that are corrupting us as a people. Like I said, our number one problem is ignorance. Now, you got all that going on and got all that um, coming against uh, people of color. Now, let's give them a negative imagery that justifies our killing them or our destroying them. So this is where media, uh, where music comes into play. What you see on TV, because we continuously become what we continuously hear and what we continuously see. Uh, like the scriptures say, as a man thinketh in his heart, so he becomes, but as a man continues to think, so he remains. 
So we're able to see that if I have control over the music industry, if I have control over Hollywood, all the movies, I can systematically give you a imagery of a people. Now who controls everything? Who controls all the all the news? Who controls the media? Who controls the music industry? We're able to see and look up who controls it. You will see it's the Jewish people. They control all these things and they give you the imagery of the perception that they want you to see of people of color that would justify your destroying of them. I feel like we losing it, you know what I'm saying? I feel like the people that are in control of what hip hop does is so f white and so f Jewish until they don't give a f about what the culture and the craft and what, the, what it really is about. I don't know if trying to really, uh, let me say this right. Cause this, I want this to be as offensive as I can fucking make it for th these old ass, uh, punks that's running these record labels. You know, that's, that's the, in the powerful positions to to dictate what the black community hears and listens to. You know what I mean? I, I, I hate that. Like that pisses me off. Like it's no way that you can tell me it's that you, that that it's not a conspiracy against the blacks in hip hop. Because you put out records that make us look stupid. You make us look dumb. You brainwash a generation, you brainwash a gener generation of hip hoppers with this crud, I, and then when, when, when these other rappers come out, splitting it down the middle, these other rappers shit sound like, wow. Wow, they, they all, you all are great. Y'all look stupid. Y'all look great. Y'all look stupid. Y'all look great. And then, you know, start going over here and then pretty soon, you know, hip hop is white now. I'm from the ghetto, so I'm used to that. Look on the map and find Texas and see where used to that. It's on the borderline of hard times. And it's seldom that you hear niggas breaking and giving God time. That's why I ask my mind to pray for me. Because I know that even I got to die and he got a day for me. And every morning I wake up, I'm kind of glad to be alive. Cause thousands of my homeboys die. They own YouTube, my space. When this ignorant gonna stop. They monopolize the news, your views, and the channel you choose. Propaganda, visual cancer, the eye in the sky, number five on the dial. Secret agenda, frequency antenna, Dr. Mindbender. Remote control, soul controller, your brain holder, slave culture, game's over. My space pimps, hoes, and sluts. Y'all exploit rap culture, then y'all flip on us. And you own the post, and y'all shit on us. What is they net worth? They gonna try to censor my next verse, throw them off the roof, neck first. Murdoch on Fox, not 18 with Barack. Yeah, but you know, it's like the gays and the and Jews run the media, you know okay. what I'm saying? And, and that, that go for radio, uh, TV, all that. My nigga, you know, I just found out the nigga uh, Mitt Romney owned called uh, Clear Channel. Wow. Yeah. The big Republican dude? Yeah, the man. man trying to be the president right we now. Man, I wonder if he can tell <laughs> fuck Master Flex what to play. Damn. You know what I mean, that's crazy, my nigga, but it is what it is. You know, if you ain't, if, if you're not in certain circles, you know, you, you ain't going past a certain point, or you might not just get in the door, or if you happen to sneak in so you can't go to the next level unless you, you know what I'm saying, you yeah. get down a certain way with certain individuals. It's running this rap. Corporate force is running this rap. So Israeli is running this rap. We poke out our asses for a chance to cash in. Cocaine is running this rap. Joe Yak and E-Pills is running this rap. Quasi homosexuals is running this rap. What yo? We run the world.
This is the Drink Champs, the number one podcast yeah, in, the, yeah. in the business. And right now, we're talking to, hands down, the most important man, in my opinion, in the whole music game. He's a mogul. He's been doing this. He personally signed me and taught me how to be a man with money. Right now, we got Leo Combs on the, on the line. Let's make some noise! Yo, yo, Leo, I got to big you up off top, man. Well, I, I want to address... Um, the comment you made about mogul. Mm. I don't I don't consider myself a mogul. Mm. Self a servant. Mm. Um I prefer yeah. if you could replace mogul with humble servant. Mm. And we all know this, we're close, and that's that's one of the reasons why we so tight as a family and why everyone in this room that's with us is always is gonna get money and get rich, because we believe in sharing. And I also wanna give a happy birthday to my son Boogie. He's my best friend too. Yeah! yeah. Is with my... Boogie Bugs! So I say, first let's make a toast to Jay-Z and Boogie and life and friendship, and then a toast to Rockefeller. Yeah. Yeah. Get the glasses around the room. That looks hot. Hey, get the glasses around the room. Get the glasses back up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Get them cup. All right, yeah. Yeah. Rock and roll for life. Rock and roll for life. New York. How? People that controlled the world and you know. Do you believe that those sort of organizations exist? I think there's friends. I think there's friends. I think there's friends. I think there's friends. I think there's cliques of friends who control things. Yeah. Rockefeller yeah. for life. Rockefeller for life. New York. My beef was with Lior because I think he's a fake CEO and I think he's fronting on my culture, but he can't front on anybody else and I'm calling him out publicly and I want him to stop trying to rape my culture, go make some money with some other people. They have people that their job is to create beef so that they can monetize it, pause, but they don't let their culture feel it, but they make money from it and they can't mon make any money or get any respect in their culture. That's why they're in our culture. It is what it is. It's a perfect example of what they always do to us. They always try to you know, offer some paper bag of money or whatever it is, whatever selfish agenda, which is the test, and then have us divide so they could benefit and take the fight off of them and put the focus on them. Never had a beef with Jay, always with Lior and his whole crew. He's the one that ruined Rockefeller. I think it's we fair to con continuously make money off our culture, not make money off your own culture, not use any of your money to help our culture, but use the money you make from us to help your own culture, and then not to give the respect to the people that are the DNA of Call Kevin Lowes. I don't think I've ever seen a Leo Cohen in Exactly. I of course you don't see interview. Of course you don't see the puppet master. I don't like who he empowers and the way he empowers them. I didn't like when he hired Todd Moskowitz to run Asylum. I didn't think Todd as a lawyer knew anything about music. It just seemed like complete nepotism and he was using other people's money. He got a job because of nepotism. Ask them why they got their jobs. That's what I want to see. How did Joey get the job president of Urban? And what does that mean? I need to see credentials. 
and not have to worry about being manipulated by somebody that's smiling, pretending that he's with you, but he's robbing you. Because when they rob you, they don't come as an enemy, they come as a friend. But I've been to these Jewish events and I have nothing against Jewish where I've seen them make Jay-Z gift speeches. And I've been like, well, I don't understand why that doesn't happen in my culture. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'll tell you right now, stay clear with Leo, he will rob you. He will ruin you for the money. And when you're with him, you look like a slave because that's how he looks at you. Trust me on that. All right, welcome back. This is Hanukkah Radio, and we have a special, special guest calling in today, a luminary in our business and a proud Jew, Leor Cohen, ladies and gentlemen. Clap it up, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Leor. Thank you. I'm, I'm so thrilled and Happy honored to be um, um, asked to do your radio station, especially on the last day of Hanukkah. L'chaim. Shalom. We are honored happening? to have you. How can I help you? Well, Leo, th this one of the things we do here is we don't necessarily get too religious and talk about Hanukkah and and what it stands for. Although you know we have gotten into that in the past, but it's more of a celebration of you know Judaism and hip hop. Since we are a hip hop station, and that's what we do, and your roots are definitely in hip hop. Hmm. Jewish people have always been involved in urban culture arts all the way back to the early beginnings of jazz music. Um, it's just something that's always happened. Right. Um, it, 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 it's a blessing. It's a blessing um, that I was lucky enough to be part of this industry, and it was a blessing that people treated me inside and out with so much respect. Now you take the music industry and you take the rappers that came out straight out of Compton. That was the biggest thing that happened that, that can destroy us as, as a people. Because initially, um, what came out was conscious rap. Rap that would let us know about the system, let us know, inform us of things that's come on. But when they came out, it was controlled by a Jewish man, and that uh, that they type of rap was gangster rap. This is the rap where you calling each other niggas, the rap that you killing each other, the rap that you glorify living in the ghetto, the rap that you glorify us uh, selling of drugs, the rap that you glorify being in poverty. What I need to ask you is as far as the manufacturing of these type of lyrics. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, so there's the the uh the myth or you know the controversy that you know the lyrics are actually influencing people to go to prison and then there's some connection that i've done with a little bit of research that you know the viacoms the big tv stations they're incorporated into the prison so you know it, it appears we got some fascism going on with hip-hop absolutely yeah there's there's definitely a connection between the uh, uh entertainment industry and uh, private prison industrial complex. Okay. You know, and it's not a mystery. You know, it's not a conspiracy theory. You know, <laughs> you can look it up. You know, uh, uh, these uh, media conglomerates they invest in the building of private prisons. You know, it's just bottom line. You know, now what's more disturbing is when you consider the type of entertainment that these companies promote. Yes. Right. So if you're promoting entertainment that glorifies criminal behavior, promotes criminal behavior, and on the flip, so you're making money off it, right? Yeah. But on the flip side, you are also investing in private prisons. So there's this very strange cycle here, you know, where you're almost getting paid from both ends. Getting yes. Paid sure. from the entertainment you promote that that glorifies criminal behavior, and you know from the jails but you know? but in some cases you know they're buying these private prisons from state you know institutions right. Right. and the state is guaranteeing them in order to you know for this long-term contract yep. that they're going to have 90 percent occupancy right. is that correct or am i yeah, no no that's what it is 90 percent occupancy that's exactly what it is you know so that's when you get you know uh money and bribes <laughs> you know going from hand to hand to make sure that laws are tough you know, that sentences are, are longer and, and harsher, you know. Um, I mean, it's it, that, that's what it is, 90%, you know, no less than 90%.
and for anyone to guarantee <laughs> that they can stay in business, you know, it's like a quota. Yeah, <laughs> it know? is a quota. Yeah, you're, you're, you're saying, I can guarantee that I'm going to get 90% occupancy, you know, in these prisons, you know. So, you know, maybe pushing entertainment that promotes criminal behavior might help <laughs> in that, in that, you know, making that promise. Well, but not only that, though, you're guaranteeing it with state lawmakers right, that can create right, right, other right, type right. of laws yeah, that exactly. can, you know, basically street strikes. Yeah, yeah, that's what that, that that's what it is. So you have so many different hands in the pot, you know, so many people involved in making this a reality. And of course, it all comes down to money. Uh, I don't know. People have probably seen the story circulating and I actually incorporated a link about this story in uh, uh, an article uh, titled Commercial Rap Pipeline to Prison, which is about um, a judge who was taking bribes. Oh, the, yeah. Uh, you saw it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, who was taking bribes to, you know, uh, uh, give longer sentences to kids. Yes. You know, from the private prison industry, and, you know, and that's not a that's not a theory. See, that's the whole thing that we have to make sure about that. People don't say, oh, you know, these conspiracy theorists with their tinfoil hat, you know, theory. <laughs> this is not a theory. We're talking about actual facts. Okay, so we can see how gangster rap and, and you know, influence of criminal activities, you know, was very connected. Mm -hmm. And, you know, how Death Row and, you know, Puffy and all these particular brands were really promoting that. With, and they were really promoting the prison and industrial pipeline. One out of four human beings with their hands on bars, shackled in the world are locked up here in the land of the free. Khalif Browder was walking home from a party when he was stopped by police. Then they said, we're gonna take you to the precinct and most likely we're gonna let you go home. And then I never went home. The 13th Amendment to the Constitution makes it unconstitutional for someone to be held as a slave exceptions, including criminals. The loophole was immediately exploited. What you got after that was a rapid transition to a mythology of black criminality. Some people got the real problem. Animals, beasts that needed to be controlled. You better believe it. I'm only human. It became virtually impossible for a politician to run and appear soft on crime. The kinds of kids that are called super predators. Millions of dollars will be allocated for prison and jail facilities. Three strikes and you are out. It was an enormous burden on the black community, but it also violated a sense of core fairness. Some people got the real the states were required to keep these prisons filled, even if nobody was committing a crime. It's so difficult to talk about mass incarceration because it has become heavily monetized. I'm only human. The focus is on taking people from prison, putting them in community corrections, parole and probation. How much progress is it really if now there's a private company making money off the GPS monitor? now have more African Americans under criminal supervision than all the slaves back in the 1850s. We are the products of the history that our ancestors chose. Products of that set of choices that we have to understand in order to escape from it. After all, don't put the blame on me. Embrace killing each other, calling each other a, a nigga. Because when you begin to kill each other, you set yourself up for the grave or you set yourself up for jail. Because I want more of you in jail than more of you to prosper. But I put you in a desperate situation like that. Now I'm controlling your perception and make you to embrace the idea of being a thug. Embrace the idea of being a hope, of being a thought, being promiscuous. I have you embrace those things that causes your demise. We are the only nation of people that enjoy listening to music that degrade ourselves. And it gives the perception of the nation of people in America what type of people you are because they get their perception of you through the imagery that are coming through the television, through the imagery that are coming through the radio uh, ways, through the imagery that are coming through magazines. And if those imageries of, of you being a slut, of you being a hoe, of you being a thug, it justifies the killing of you because the first thing that happens 
when there's a police shooting and the police is at fault, what do they always go? They always go back into the male's history and calls him a criminal and calls him a thug. What did that do? You lose your humanity for that person. And you think, oh, he was a thug. He had a criminal history. And now you, but you justify the killing of that person based off the imagery that you have been given. So if we want to move forward, we got to take away the poisons that's in our community. We got to quit killing each other and listen to music that make us degrade one another. That make us begin to act out these things that is causing our demise. So one of the things that are causing our demise, one of the things that they added to the imagery of black people that caused us to refuel and kill ourselves was the imagery of the TV the radio waves, the um, uh, entertainment industry. We have to look at those things and see who own those things that produce things of negative in insight in order to destroy the minds of the morality of a nation. We must look at the music and entertainment industry and get those poisons out of our thinking and out of our generation and out of our legacy. talked about America's dark past, the Emancipation Proclamation, the illusion of freedom. But we never want to identify the problem without giving solutions. And the number one solution that I believe that we all must do is to come back into right alignment with the Creator. The Creator has given us His instructions. We are people that needs to be governed by laws, that needs to be governed um, by commandments, that needs to be governed by the diagram that the Creator, the Most High, left for us to live by. Now, He didn't leave us alone. He gave us an example of a person, which is His Son, the world who ignorant calls him Jesus, but his name is Yeshua, that will give us the steps on how to become a nation, how to become one, how to please uh, the Father in his instructions. Now, the number two solution that I believe is relationship, because number, the number one thing that they was trying to destroy even in the Willow Lynch letter, it's the relationship between the man and the woman. The number one thing that's the foundation of every nation is the marriage relationship between one man and a woman that would bridge the gap, that would bring on the children, that would bring the family structure. So we must get educated on the original intention and purpose that the Creator had for a man and a husband and the original intention and instructions that the Most High had for a woman and for family. We have to learn how to love each other. We have to learn how to uh, 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 be in a, a holy matrimony. We have to learn how to have that family structure to be the example to show the rest of the world. The next thing that we have to get educated on is our health because we can't move if we're still eating these things that have been set up to destroy us so we don't have to depend on a system and their medical uh, system. We already have a system within our culture throughout the scripture that teaches us how to eat that we may have health to be able to do these things and create a legacy for our children. One of the last and final solutions that I believe that we need to be educated on is finances. How to economically move dependent of this system because throughout history we was able to see that this system has been set up against us so why would we trust this system so we must learn how to walk and how to move economically first as a family and then economically as a community and then economically as a nation of the descendants of African people that went through the African diaspora so those are my solution become one with the creator get in the right alignment with him build and get educated upon the relationship of the family, the home structure. Number three, get educated in our health that we are moving and taking care of our health dependent, independent of the system. And number four, getting educated and become educated on financial literacy that we are moving economically together because the only thing that will make this nation Pay attention. It won't be the marching. It won't be the screaming. It won't be the hollering. But it's if we learn how to move as a unit economically and everybody within the nation becoming economically, financially literate. So those are important for us to build a foundation to move together as a nation and be represented as a chosen people here in the Americas moving forward. Shalom and God bless. me
Maybe I'm foolish, maybe I'm blind Thinking I can see through this and see what's behind Got no way to prove it, so maybe I'm lying But I'm only human after all I'm only human after all Don't put your blame on me Don't put your blame on me Take a look in the mirror What do you see? Do you see it clearer? Or are you deceived? In what you believe? Cause I'm only human after all And you're only human after all Don't put the blame on me Don't put your blame on me You Israelites, you black people in this country, what do you say about them? You call them animals? I call them inferior, I call you slaves, we turn you into slaves, and when we didn't need them no more, we kick you out of Israel, and, I mean out of Egypt, but out of Africa, we sold you to America, and that's where we want you to stay, we don't want you back.